It's time for Mac Break Weekly. Andy's here. Alex is here. Jason Snell is still in New Zealand, but we've got a great replacement. Marco Arment joins us. He was lead developer on Tumblr back in the day. You might remember his Insta paper. And, of course, he is currently the guy, the one-man guy, one-man band behind the best podcast player out there, Overcast. He also has a lot to say about the future of podcasting. And uh, we're going to have a lot of fun. Mac Break Weekly is next. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Mac Break Weekly, episode 859, recorded Tuesday, February 28th, 2023. Slip into the warm apple bath. This episode of Mac Break Weekly is brought to you by Fast Mail. Reclaim your privacy, boost productivity, and make email yours with Fast Mail. Try it free for 30 days at fastmail.com slash twit. Fast Mail is also giving Twit listeners a 15% discount on the first year when you sign up today. Thanks for listening to this show as an ad-supported network. We are always looking for new partners with products and services that will benefit our qualified audience. Are you ready to grow your business? Reach out to advertise at twit.tv and launch your campaign now. It's time for Mac Break Weekly, the show where we cover the latest Apple news, of which there is precious little, but we'll we'll find something to talk about. Actually, there's some good news. Jason Snell is still in Kiwi Land, New Zealand. So we have brought in a ringer, but I'll introduce him in a moment. But first, Alex Lindsay's here from OfficeHours.Global and 090.media. Hello, hello. Hello, Alex. I love. He was on uh, Twitter on Sunday, and you mid-journeyed the uh, title, and we used it as our thumbnail. <laughs> you, a- didn't, you didn't use the goofy one, though. I, 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 there, was, there was two that were relatively on point, and then there was one that was just completely weird and absurd. I was like, oh, I wonder if they're going to use that who, one. Who edited that? Was that... Uh, <laughs> Kevin? So Kevin decided to go. Uh, he was probably. He, he went, he went, I, I've he went seen safe. him. He went I safe. saw those images. I think it was safer that we went with the. Ones John Ashley the says it was better that we didn't go with the goofy one. Yeah. Let me, let me, just, so let me just look. Which one was the goofy one? The was dog. It this? The dog. Here, show. I got it's it. On the dog. The that one? No, no, no. Not those. No, no, no. That the one? dog with. The, no, the that one? The one? Okay. I with think the they cheerleaders? <laughs> they put Mean Girls. Because the, the, the. Oh, that the, was Mean Girls. Right. Fetch happens. I couldn't so, quite get one that was perfect. So there was a couple of weird hands and stuff like that. But the dog, the, the expression on the dog was priceless. <laughs> okay. It's like, well, we'll use here? it today. <laughs> no, no, we don't need that. That's Marco I'll make going, you a new one. What the hell are we doing here? Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Andy Anako is also with us. Hello, Andrew from WGBH in Boston. Hey there, hi there, who there? Good to see you, sir. That's all peace. Uh, and our ringer, ladies and gentlemen, if this were a softball team, this would be the slugger, the guy we brought in to hit it out of the park. Uh, Jason couldn't be here, but I'm thrilled to have Marco Arment here. Marco, good to see you. Hello. Good to finally be here again. It's been what? 10 years. Every 700 episodes we have Marco on. He was on 702 (laughs) episodes ago. So, well, you know, so let's see, this is 800. What is it? 892. We'll have you on again. And <laughs> oh my God, it's years, Probably ten years, say that is. ten years, <laughs> ten, ten years. years. <laughs> Marco, you know Marco because many of you use his software, Overcast at Overcast.fm. That's easily the best podcast software uh, out there. Except, doesn't do video. So for us, you know, a lot of our users do use something else because they want the video. Are you gonna ever add video to Overcast? I don't know. It's kind of a different thing, you know. Like it, it requires so many different considerations and. And, um, you know, I, I don't know. I, it's one of those things like it's always on my to do list, but it's never high enough on the to do list to actually get done. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, probably not if I'm honest. Be honest. That's fine. Marco, of <laughs> course, is a podcaster himself. He appears on much more, you know, popular shows like the Accidental Tech Podcast, uh, his show, actually, along with Casey List and John Syracuse. Uh, he is really, I think Marco really is, uh, there's a, I've always thought of this. There's a gang of, of, of kind of Mac people. And, uh, Andy, I always thought Andy was one. Jason was one. You're one. Uh, John Gruber. There's just these, these people, uh, who are in the inner circle. And I always standing outside, look and say, have fun at <laughs> Apple park. 
Just say hi to Steve Jobs Theater and watch as you guys uh, go in. But uh, it's nice to have somebody like that on the show who really knows what he's talking about. You, you're, you're, you still code, though, which is, is interesting. You haven't given that up. No, I, I honestly don't see an end in sight for that. I mean, I, I love writing my own code. And, and Overcast is a one-person company. And so there is no one to take it over for me. Uh, and I like... I like having a one-person company. There's a lot of advantages to that, and it's just I work better that way uh, in many ways. And yeah. so uh, I just I kind of like doing it all myself. And you know, I don't I don't always have the time to do like a ton of coding, uh, but when I do, I you know I work very efficiently as far as I can, and uh, I get some stuff done sometimes. It's cool. You still do a, a coding podcast under the radar uh, mm -hmm. with uh, David Smith. Um, is it Swift? Is it all Swift now that you're doing these days? Mostly. Overcast is still mostly Objective-C. So whenever I'm working on existing code, I'm, a, I'm an Objective-C and stuff. But I'm trying to do all the new stuff in Swift. And that's it's a massive project to try to like bring everything over. But, I bet. you know, that, that's that's kind of my current like, you know, long term project that I'm working on. Right. Uh, and of course, was the lead developer at Tumblr back in the day. Tumblr is actually having a little bit of a resurgence with Elon Musk letting uh, Twitter <laughs> die on the vine, so to speak. Uh, I, I'm using Tumblr a lot. We had uh, Matt Mullenweg on uh, a few months ago, and he, he 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 was really excited about the future for Tumblr. It must be nice to see your baby still uh, still kicking. It really is, I, and and you know I couldn't be happier that Matt has it because you know what he does perfect, is he right? does such good work yeah, on the web. He's like yeah. he's the perfect owner for it, um, and you know he and I I think our our um, our principles align a lot on a lot of things. And uh, yeah, I like Matt a lot. So nice. I, I'm actually, I'm very optimistic. I'm, I, you know, when, when, it, when Tumblr was going through, you know, like the, the whole, you know, Verizon, you know, kind Ugh, of doldrums, horrible. I was worried about it. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I kind of had, had thought, you know, well, I guess that's the end. Um, but, but no, now it, it has this wonderful resurgence and uh, that's in, in part thanks to, you know, Twitter exodus, but also I think in much larger part because, you know, automatic is doing a really good job with it so far. Yeah. Uh, Matt's really a, a proponent of open source too, which I which I kind of like. I mean, I think uh, I know you don't work in open source, or do you? Do you do open source stuff at all? Here and there, not not to the degree that he does. You know, right. I, I I use I use a bunch of open source, obviously, like everybody does. Um, I I have some open source projects that I have created, um, but nothing big. You, uh, I I looked at your Twitter, and you haven't been there in a few months. You, you've moved over to the Masto, which is good. I like that. We've got your Mastodon uh, link on the uh, page. They wouldn't. Oh, actually, they do let you uh, do it on uh, on Twitter. That's interesting. How do you get the lock logo in there? I like that. Does that mean I set my account to private? Private. Okay, <laughs> that's good. I have to do that. Yeah. You are legacy verified. You may or may not be notable. I don't know if you. <laughs> I don't know if you've noticed that, but it goes back and forth. So every once, you know, I check every once in a while just to see. Well, am I notable or not? And uh, at the moment, I'm notable, but but I've also had the legacy. It's like they can't decide; like they're going back and forth. It's shocking that something about Twitter is fluctuating <laughs> randomly. Wow! I, I was really sad they uh, laid off on Saturday. The Twitter, and this isn't the Twitter show, but I'll just mention this parenthetically: that they laid off a bunch of people, including I was sad to see Leah Culver, who. Uh, uh, oh, I, I didn't know she didn't make it through. She didn't mm. make it through. Well, she made it through until oh, Saturday. Man. Right. Yeah. That's I was I was surprised she made it as far as she did. But but yeah. Wow. That's yeah. Bad. She was unlike uh, some people. She didn't become an Elon Stan to save her job. She was <laughs> circumspect. I remember her posting on Twitter. I got my stat, my printout. <laughs> it was like this. thin. <laughs> uh, and then the last thing she tweeted, which is kind of sad, is that her space. She was doing spaces. And somehow she pushed something on spaces that broke other things on Twitter. <laughs> and she says, thank goodness. The team caught it and and turned it off, but she was a little uh, embarrassed. I don't think that's why she got fired. I think she got fired because she wasn't enough of a stan. Um, yeah, and, yeah. And it's, you know, who, who we've we've all pushed crazy things. Yeah, I mean, it God, happens. when I was yeah. <laughs> like when I was a Tumblr, I you know if I like you know made a made the wrong keystroke somewhere, we would serve like eleven thousand error pages per second until I fixed it. <laughs> <laughs> that's that was not good for the stress levels, honestly. And that no. was and that was way smaller than Twitter scale. Like I can't even imagine like doing what she was doing. Oh my god, I I couldn't handle it. Yeah, they Marco Arment report to the conference room. Marco Arment <laughs> yeah. report to the conference room, please. Oh. Yeah, she uh, she said, "Welp, I accidentally took down Twitter. You can blame email Elon if you like." 
I turned on a Spaces feature that did not perform well at scale. Luckily, the site stability team was on it right away, and we rolled it back. Current mood, fail whale. Aww. Well, I'm, Leia will land uh, well, I'm sure. She's, she's super talented uh, and a great coder. She was the co-creator of OAuth. So mm -hmm. I think the open yeah. source community will welcome her with open arms. All right, enough pestering you, Marco, although I have many more questions. Uh, but we should probably talk about other things. There is this is there is Apple stuff to talk about. Steve Jobs' birthday uh, was February twenty fourth, and I'm you know the Steve Jobs archive, which has kind of laid lain fallow since they uh, launched it. It was launched by uh, uh, his uh, widow and some friends to to host some things. There were memos there and things. They posted a picture, uh, and I think kind of a cute picture of uh, of Jobs in New Orleans. Uh, in February 84, what happened in January 84, the Mac came out and he was staring through the window of, I think this was like a, let's see, it says, I think a Best Buy or something like that and at, at a woman who was sitting down at the demo Macintosh. There it is, the, the very first Mac playing with it. And he was watching avidly to see, I bet he was actually, this was his own user testing. It's kind of a cool uh, inside photo of uh, Steve. Yeah. Those are the stories that don't get out. More, the, the ones that have the greatest velocity are when he gets angry and does something, uh, yeah. does something dramatic. But the to, to me, like the canonical Steve Jobs is always like during a demo of uh, of anything, watching him like especially especially at one of the smaller venues like a town hall in Apple, like watching him like off to the side. Like in the dark, there's no light on him, but you can kind of, if not paying attention to the, to the video, you can watch him. And he is watching very, very closely. And you can see him smiling as certain hits uh, appear in the video. That's, I hope that that's something that the Steve Jobs project uh, kind of illustrates. Take back President's Day, make February 24th Steve Jobs Day. You wouldn't, you'd, you'd get no pushback <laughs> uh, from me. Here is, they're, they're slowly posting like old memos and stuff. Here's a weird poem that he sent to himself in 2010 shortly before his uh, death about a year before his death he wrote a little uh i speak a language i did not invent or refine i do not make any of my own clothing i did not discover the mathematics i use i grow a little of the food i eat i'm protected by freedom and laws i did not conceive i'm moved by music i did not create when i needed medical attention i was helpless to help myself survive i did not invent the transistor the microprocessor object-oriented programming or most of the technology I work with. I love and admire my species, living and dead, and I am totally dependent on them for my life and well-being. That's, uh, damn, that's, kind of, that's pretty profound, huh? Very I cool. do note that he forgot to change the uh, default signature in Apple Mail on the iPad. It says sent from my iPad. But other than that, you'd think that'd be the first thing <laughs> Jobs would do, right? He probably wrote that. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it's probably his idea. He's like, let's put it in there. Oh, guarantee you, it was his idea, right? Guarantee you. So they're slowly putting stuff up there. This is a uh, 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 jo Tim Cook apparently, uh, Johnny Ive, uh, and uh, uh, Steve's uh, widow are have put this all together. So I think yeah. that's really cool. I think that's really cool, and a, and yeah. a beautiful. I think I like it. That's such a personal photo of uh, of Steve. Um, looking at his creation, which if you remember that time, he was already embattled, right? The Lisa had was a flop. Uh, he'd hired uh, the Pepsi guy <laughs> to run the place. And uh, the Pepsi guy wasn't too happy about Macintosh and shortly after uh, uh, fired Steve. So he was already kind of, I think, realized he was he was one of the pirates, not not one of the uh, one of the owners. The picture, we should give credit to uh, Steve's friend, Gene Pagozzi, who calls himself a serious amateur photographer. Uh, Gene didn't work at tech, but Steve invited him along to a software conference in New Orleans one evening after the event. As they were walking down O'Keefe Avenue looking for dinner, Steve, a notoriously fast walker, pulled to a halt. Someone in the <laughs> store window was working on a Macintosh. He had to take a closer look. How is this person using the Mac? Steve is so curious, so lasered in on trying to understand that he's bent nearly uh, double. Yeah. Anyway, that's the history this week. Is there anything new this week, Mark? Are you going to buy a 15 inch MacBook Air M2 when that comes out, if it comes out? 
I think I'll be one of the only people in the world who doesn't buy it. But man, I like I hope they release it just because so many people want that machine. You know, the 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 MacBook Air, it it's such a good computer now. I mean, it's always been pretty good, but now it's like there there's almost no downside for almost any workload to be done on a MacBook Air. It's it is the default computer for everyone, and it should be. And the one big thing holding it back for a lot of people was I want something a little bit bigger. I want a little bit more screen space or whatever. And and, you know, until now, well, until this comes out, um, you know, you had to just jump to something that cost twice as much money. And, uh, you know, to have to have another option here that, you know, takes just the same specs of the MacBook Air and just adds a bigger screen and changes basically nothing else and doesn't incur all the cost of all the higher end parts that are in the MacBook Pros. Uh, that, I think, is going to be a blockbuster. I think it's really true that from almost, I would say, 99 percent of people using Macs, you, you don't need a pro that the MacBook Air is kind of amazingly performant. I have the M2 MacBook Air and I still want the 15 inch. I, I won't <laughs> buy it, but it's tempting. Andy, are you tempted? Wanna? You know what? I, I keep coming. I keep coming closer around to it. The only uh, uh, I think that the only limiting thing for the MacBook Air for me is that I do. I can't afford to have lots and lots of different Macs. And so right. uh, whatever, whatever laptop I get is probably going to do double duty on my desktop. And I really like the idea of being able to have more than one external display. But really, when you consider that that's the only limitation of a device that used to be the MacBook of eternal compromise, you only get 64 gigs of storage. You only get one USB port. The battery is not that great. Uh, all uh, the, the keyboard is not going to be as good as what you get on a regular MacBook. But people were screaming for it anyway. Just the idea of having some something that is not quite so thick and heavy and uh, and bulky that gets all the that ticks all the boxes i mean i i think mark was absolutely right i mean if if if, uh, if it were important to reorganize by logic the the names of products in the in the mac line i think that the macbook air should become the macbook uh, to free up the the term macbook air for something that has the original cachet something that okay it only has one usb c port however it is no thicker than uh, an ipad pro with the smart keyboard attached to it uh, and it's not as powerful but if you want something for a thousand dollars that you basically won't even think about leaving at home there is your deal for you alex you were going to say something I'll cut you off oh i just I'm, I'm really looking forward to something larger it could it could bring me back around i have to admit that i have a 14 inch macbook pro um and i dislike the size so much i realized i've almost stopped using a laptop really too, too <laughs> you small know, like i, too I small got it because you? it was being more portable yeah. i just find it so painful like it's just it's just so i just get angry all the time oh, i love <laughs> when i'm using 14 inch. if i hadn't <laughs> poured like, coffee into it computer. i'd still be using oh, it I'm, I'm thinking it. now we saw the uh, story this week that apple has apparently bought up all of tsmc's three nanometer process <laughs> no it's yeah. every single chip every one of them uh which isn't as much as you might, that might, in, you know, imply, oh, my God, they're going to make a lot of M3 la laptops or desktops. But but they only, uh, uh, right now, at least, according to uh, uh, the rumor, are making 45,000 units uh, in March. So 45,000 times 12 is not a lot. It's not but as many. That's got to be about the iPhone, right? Like, cause, yeah, you know, it's they, not they, even all the started... iPhones. I mean, it means you won't, the iPhone 15 will probably... Have two chips, right? An M2 and an M3, if they or A15 and A16 or whatever they call it. Yeah, because yeah, you know, they, they started months. this pattern, you know, last year of having the the you know quote consumer level iPhone and then the Pro and actually have different chips for the first time. Uh, and so this gives them. I, I think part of the reason they might have done that was to prepare for this fall when the Pro phone presumably has a three nanometer chip, but they probably don't have enough production capacity to make every iPhone of the year use that process node so that my guess is that's what this is for that that you know where they're going to have three nanometer for the pro phones they might even push the price a little bit higher to encourage you know not, not only reap a lot of profit because that usually works for them but also then to encourage more people to pick the consumer one who were kind of on the fence now that the sizes match up there's you know there's not a lot of reason for many people to jump to the pro although people keep doing it anyway <laughs> so and look i'm guilty of this as well uh, i don't i don't really need the pro but i like the pro so i get the pro i would I'm, honestly <laughs> and, uh, yeah i would i mean if, if the only thing keeping me from buying a 15 inch is the idea of getting an a uh an m3 with an oled screen uh is pretty tempting that but you're you're sounds like you're saying don't expect that anytime soon they're going to use them all up on the iphone 
I mean, I'm sure there's going to be some Macs that have, you know, something called an M3 that has three animated process, um, presumably, but I don't know when, you know, the M2s just came out, uh, the M2, you know, the M2 Pro and Max just came out. We still don't have an M2 Ultra. We we don't even know if we're going to have an M2 Ultra. Um, and then the M3 timeline is still a mystery. But I, I think we, if they follow the same timeline they've been doing for, you know, for the M series so far, then we shouldn't expect the very first M3 products until at least this fall and possibly later. Yeah. Uh, and that would be, that wouldn't be the high end ones. That would be, you know, the regular M3. Um, and, but that, that it, it might not be this fall. Maybe they have, maybe they need to save the capacity for iPhones at first. Maybe we won't see M3, uh, M3 Max until the spring or next summer. Who knows? Yeah. Uh, you may remember the soap opera around all this. TSMC uh, increased the cost for the uh, three nanometer process chips. Apple balked, but apparently gave in <laughs> because uh, uh, according to Digitimes, again, Apple doesn't announce it, uh, but according to Digitimes, they have purchased the entire run of M3 chips. The yields, I'd also heard that the yields were good on the uh, on the three nanometer mo node, but uh, if you compare 45,000 wafers a month in March to what they're doing right now with the previous node, the five nanometer mode, which is 1.3 million a month, that's a big difference. Extreme Tech calls well, it an artisan small batch product. <laughs> well, at, at the moment, you know, I think that I think the thing is, is that you know, assuming that they would continue at the same pace for a year is probably they get faster. They probably, Yields they go probably up, get right? you know once they yeah. once they kind of get the thing running. And I think that it's important. One of the things that Apple is doing really effectively right now is pulling away from everybody else, you know, and both in power consumption as well as power. Um, and so I think that they don't. I don't think they want to lose. I think that the game of chicken that TM, TMC did, um, they won. <laughs> decided to play. They won. Apple blinked. And uh, now they can make as many as they want with. And and I'm sure that if they came back to Apple and did that, I'm sure that the cost of production was higher as well like i think that's probably where it was driven from is that it's probably a lot harder to make these because i mean when you think about i don't know if we step back and look at what three nanometer three nanometer actually means it's an insane well it doesn't ironically um, actually mean three nanometers among other things but, but no but i mean just three nanometers like, <laughs> like yeah i'm just saying that it's, it's an uh, like the chips of you know the, the, the oh it's amazing is just, absolutely just amazing truly amazing yeah, yeah 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 it's incredible what they're doing uh in fact i'm of the impression and maybe i'm wrong but i think others of the impression that the m2 slash a15 is kind of a because it wasn't a big jump from the M1, right? Is kind of a interim on the way to what it, will be another it, big jump, which is the the three nanometer M3. And chip. it could be a TikTok like they've done another thing, yeah, other things, other technologies like where yeah. you know you may see a you may see the uh, M3 make a big another, a bigger jump, and then the M4 being a lighter jump, and then the M you know like it, it could be. And uh, you're right, Marco. I mean, it's not. I'm not talking this year. Uh, obviously, the iPhone will eat up all of this product. Uh, for. Maybe I mean it, it. It may be that they that these are really put into the desktop, into the computers before they're put into the phone. You I mean, think? Because because just well because you can't get if they don't have the supply in the fall, you know if they don't have enough that they can reasonably put out. Although they could put them out and say, well, you're going to wait for the next six months to get them. <laughs> you know, like that's the other mm -hmm. option is they're only in the pros, and if you don't order them the first day, you'll wait until January to see one, um, which we've seen in the past. So so it's not impossible that they just are they just put them out as fast as they can make them. Yeah, if you can only make half a million chips a year, that is not even close enough. There's, there's a lot of us now that have just gotten to the habit that there's going to be some there's going to be some morning in September that at 5 a.m. we are uh, hammering <laughs> the website to make sure that we we get uh, get something uh, in, in a reasonable now, amount of time. This, they, they say this is wafers. I don't know. You know the way silicon uh, chips are made, they make these larger things and then cut them up. I don't know if that means. It might not mean 45,000 microprocessors. It might mean 45,000 weight of the big silicon wafers, which can then be chopped up into hundreds or thousands of individual chips. So it really may be many more than half a million a year. I, I'm not sure exactly what they're talking about. But when they say wafers, it sounds like that's the big mm -hmm. thing. <laughs> that's a technical term, you know, the big, <laughs> the big round thing. I have Excellent. one on my wall. John, where is it? Do you know where that uh, big wafer is? 
We should get one. This is an old. This is this is probably a forty-five nanometer in the, process. <laughs> in, in the in the ta- in the teardowns, it'll be interesting to see how much more they keep on moving into the into the chip as well. I mean, so every every iteration, if we've seen stuff that they've talked about in the past, every iteration is going to have less and less external processing. You know, where they're just going to keep yeah. on. It, it sounds like I mean, it sounds like there's some trajectory where four or five years from now. There's just a solid chip that gets inserted into the phone and we're like, okay, we're done, um, you know, with, without much peripheral because they talk about legacy, legacy parts. Um, that's kind of a language you use when you're getting rid of them. Yeah. Yeah. Just like with, there are a lot of rumors this week about uh, the timetable for uh, Apple's cellular modem. And it's it'd be nice to have a separate chip for that, just like with use with, with Qualcomm. But you can imagine that their goals are to have one iPhone system on a chip that has everything on one die. Uh, and they're moving that way, aren't they? Huh? Yeah. Oof, so kind of impressive, really. Now, TSMC is in Taiwan. The other big story of the week is Apple. And we've been talking about this for some time, gradually uh, trying to get out of China and uh, and move to other places. Probably not Taiwan. I'm thinking more India, Brazil, Vietnam. Mm-hmm. Did see one story this week that said uh, Vietnam's going to be much more expensive uh, to produce. Here's a story from um, uh, Bloomberg. Apple suppliers are racing to exit China, AirPods maker says. Yeah, it's not just Apple. It's it's all their suppliers. I mean, this is it's a it is a serious, serious threat for Apple. It's an existential threat for their suppliers. You know, their 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 um, their suppliers are. This is a, a life and death situation if something goes wrong with if. For, for the companies that are in China right now, if 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 there's an attack on on Taiwan, which is what everyone's worried about, and right. I just I just feel like this is the most from from a government perspective, it, it is the most insane thing. I I mean, Russia going into Ukraine was insane. China talking about Taiwan four years from now is more insane because what it does is it tells every supplier in China get out of town, and so they're like literally burning their own business, their own industry to the ground. Because no one well, wants to be here in 2027. Yeah, you know, like that's the. I mean, like no one, no one wants to be left there because yeah. the, anybody, you know, if, if and and whether they go in or not, the 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 broadcast of it is just it's absolute insanity, you know. And and so it's and so that all these suppliers are are trying to, you know, diversify as fast as they can. I mean, I don't think anyone wants to be there right now. As an example from the uh, Bloomberg story, AirPods maker Goer Tech. Uh, which today cranks out the bulk of the world's gadgets from iPhones to PlayStations, is investing an additional $280 million in a new Vietnam plant while considering an India expansion. Um, and, of course, Apple's been doing the same thing. TSMC is building a big plant in the U.S. Uh, it won't be a three nanometer plant. Yeah. Uh, it'll be a larger node, but still. Uh, as, I mean, those legacy nodes are just as important. You could build a, You could have a phone that has a beautiful A16 chip in it, but no, nothing else. <laughs> it really isn't a phone in that case. Well, you look at the, in the audio industry, one, one factory burned down in Japan and they're still recovering. Yeah. I mean, there's some, there's some devices that will never get made again because that, that, you know, the A, AD, A to D processor um, went down and that's, you know, so it, it, you know, it only takes one chip to bring, bring a lot of this stuff back. Two months ago, uh, Guomingji said Apple has abandoned its iPhone SE in 2024. Now, Guomingji says, yes, they're going to do a fourth generation iPhone SE with a 6.1 inch OLED display and an Apple designed 5G chip. That's that's I I guess that's that modem chip you were talking about, Andy. Um, So they're getting so they are getting close to getting their own uh, modem. But obviously, everything on one chip would be Apple's goal, right? Just make all one big. Yeah. But it's, chip. But, it's, but it's going to take a couple of years of actual like consumer dog fooding before they're going to put that modem chip into a flagship phone. This is I, I believe this rumor because it makes a lot of sense that they would put it in a lesser phone, not 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 because they don't think it's going to work, but because they know they're not going to see where the fi- failure points are until they put until they have actual like a million users actually using it. Um, there uh, another st- story is that. 
uh, one of the problems that they're having, uh, Apple, is uh, not with the plain old uh, simple uh, 5G, but uh, the millimeter wave component of it, the, the stuff that gives you the really, really super fast uh, transfers. And so to put it in a budget phone where hopefully people who are buying those phones don't really care about it. I mean, millimeter wave is not a huge big a deal, d- depending on where you happen to live to take advantage of it. Uh, but yeah, I like that idea. And I also think that the first really the first generation of iphones that has any kind of a brand new modem chip it's going to be a lot of hurt for a lot of people in those edge cases not for not for 90 percent of the people but you just have to be part of that five percent or ten percent to make this the worst phone you ever you ever had and apple does not want that phone to have an apple logo on it yeah this is exactly what yeah. Quo's saying the significant decline in qualcomm's apple orders in the foreseeable future is a foregone conclusion no more qualcomm uh, yeah, even, even the CEO of Qualcomm was saying that we expect Apple to Apple to have their modem sooner rather than later. I don't think that was official investor guidance, but I think that that was sort of where he was going with that. Yeah, it's still being. I, mean, I would imagine Qualcomm's still making tons of money off the patents. Oh, yeah. Like you know, even even if Apple makes a modem, I bet a lot of the cost of that is still going to Qualcomm in the end of the get, at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah, this is this is their transition right from a hardware maker to to a patent uh, an IP <laughs> company. Um, it's still being determined, quote, tweets, whether the iPhone 16 series will use Apple's 5G baseband chip. The main challenge lies in whether Apple can overcome the technical obstacles related to millimeter wave and satellite communication. So I guess that's the Qualcomm chips have that. Nevertheless, once the SE4 starts using Apple's 5G baseband chip, it's a foregone conclusion. Qualcomm's orders will decline, assuming mass production goes smoothly in the first half of next year. So that's important. First half of next year, the iPad and Apple Watch will soon abandon Qualcomm's baseband chips too. You know, Quo writes these an analyst, so he writes these for uh, investors. So this is this is more uh, you know investment and, advice than anything else. And I have to say that I mean, I'm sure they're still making a lot of money from the patent. But whatever they thought they were going to get out of a lawsuit, I'm not sure if that it turned out. out so good. You know, yeah. like I, I don't think that they, you know, like in the end, you know, you, you get into a big fight like this. And the same thing with Epic. I mean, they whatever they thought they were going to make more of, um, you know, make more going down that path, like picking a fight with a very, very large. You just got to really think through that from a five or 10 year curve, not from the initial impetus. Um, and I think that I don't think that Qualcomm played that 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 deck very well. No. Uh, all right, let us take a little break. We've got Marco Arment with us. In fact, I'm going to make this offer to our uh, Discord users. We've got a stage open. If there's, if any of you want to ask questions of Marco, Marco, is anything off limits? Can they ask about your celebrity wife? Yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> all right, nothing is off limits. Uh, raise your hand in the stage if you have a question. We'll see if we get enough questions. Uh, we can, we can pepper. Marco Arment, it's really great to have uh, him and his coffee bean bags uh, on the show with us today. <laughs> this is a uh, th- does it? Don't do forget you- my fish mug. <laughs> oh, look at that! <laughs> you know we uh, we went to see Umphrey's McGee. Speaking of jam bands, it's on a fish coaster, of course. You know. Oh, good. <laughs> look at that! Did you make that Crocheted yourself? Crocheted by somebody? On- yeah. No, somebody on Etsy made them. Oh, that's that's <laughs> really cute. How do you know that's a fish coaster? Is that their? Uh, logo or something yeah it's it's a whole thing it's you know it's their drummer wears a, a moo moo that has this pattern on it oh uh, for every show it's a whole thing yeah <laughs> oh my it's, God. it's not worth it john you it's found, a shibboleth you found your equal john is a uh, umphrey's mcgee stand and you found your equal fish stand here um <laughs> do, <laughs> totally do, do you like other jam bands or is it all fish all the time I like other jam bands too but they're they're my number one by by a pretty wide margin i don't know if fish does this i wouldn't be surprised if they did we went to see Humphreys McGee uh, on Thursday of last week, and this is so cool. For thirty bucks extra, they will provide you with a little Sennheiser uh, headphone. This is a wireless headphone amp, or and you can bring your own headphones, or they offer headphones. I brought my own uh, in ear monitors. You plug in, and now you're hearing the soundboard instead of the crappy. I don't care how good a band is and how good their sound is. It's never as good as if you're listening on the board, right? This was awesome. the best thing about that. Then you can control the volume. Like, you exactly. know, if, if, if I actually go to a concert, I wear concert earplugs and then you're cutting out a lot of high frequency. Yeah. It doesn't quite sound even as good. You know? Yeah. Right. Where if you if you have like, you know, super isolating like IEMs, 
and then you have something like that, you can control the yes. volume, but still be it experiencing so it live. Yeah. That's a really cool thing. It protected you, you my didn't ears. feel separated. You didn't feel separated. No, from folks. because you you're still did. feeling the uh -huh. bump and you're still feeling the elbows. You're still in the crowd. <laughs> and actually and, it was interesting because my wife is with me and she's saying, are they, is that, is the band swearing at us? And she finally realized, <laughs> no, no, the mics are picking up the audience out in the, in the crowd. Right. So you hear the audience through the mics. Uh, no, you're very much there, but and, and just, what, just to sorry, say, what, Marco, what transmitter? you're not definating yourself. This is, so this is what yeah. we use as well. This is the Sennheiser uh, 300 IEM, um, and so they and and you oh you you rent they, it. You rent it. They have it there. They have a table. You go up there. Give me your thirty bucks. Did you buy it? Do you buy it with a ticket? Or you and, you and and you're wired. You're wired to that, and it's wireless to pick it up. Yeah. So you turn this up, and if you want it louder, if you want to deafen yourself, you can. But it was funny. I took out the monitors just to hear. And, it, you know, concert hall sound, especially, you know, this was at the Mystic Theater in Petaluma, not notorious for its, <laughs> its sound. <laughs> and it's, <laughs> you put this in and it's, oh, it's suddenly you hear, it's clear, it's incredible. Does Fish do that, Marco? No, I, I not that I know. They I mean, should. I went to a couple shows last summer. That, I've never seen that. They That's should. a really cool idea. Yeah, we I, would, I would jump on that in a heartbeat. Yeah. And do they just take your? Do they take your license or something to make sure you bring it back? Or how do you like? How do you get it? They're expensive. Aren't they, they charge a deposit. One dollar. Oh, but then they have your credit card. Yeah. So, yeah. So we should probably give this back. I didn't mean to take <laughs> it home. I just. No, this is ours. We use these. It's funny because this is what we use for our in ear monitors. Uh, during the show for our uh, talk back. So I'm not wearing it right now, but uh, yeah, it really sounded good. I have to say. We've talked about that. I, I work on concerts. <laughs> so we've you talked should about do the it idea. totally. We've talked about the idea of giving everybody, everybody in ear um, for, if you're recording the band, what, what I'm really interested in is recording the band and I specifically want to put it into 5.1. So my whole thing is, is the crowd kind of screws that all up um, by making all that noise that goes into my, you know, the, the, it's Don't the speakers. That? I want to hear the crowd. I want to hear the crowd. I just want to record them separately. Right. So, so anyway, so, right. so to put them in, into things. And so I don't want, I don't want to, I don't want to corrupt it with the speakers, but, and so the idea of having a, uh, because to me, the idea would be to take, turn, take, get rid of the speakers all together and, just give everybody in ear. I mean, really interesting. They call it headphones and snow cones, which is one of their uh, songs. And uh, $30, $1 credit card hold includes belt pack, headphone rental, and one hell of a good time. <laughs> they say, <save you>. Mark, <laughs> Marco, do you, do you do what do you, fish is really known for live streaming. Do you watch any of those streams? Sometimes. Yeah. Like for the big ones, like new years, if I'm not doing anything that year, I'll do it. But I, I, I purchase all of the uh, soundboard recordings from their site. Like yes. they have this live fish site. You get mm -hmm. all the shows and it's, it's so nice being a fish fan because like you they make every show available for download for like 11 bucks and it's really high quality it's you know yeah. it's it, they professionally master every single one of them just like what you're talking about yeah. and so it's it's really great it, it's a it's a wonderful thing because you get so much new music from them and it's all really well very it's very accessible yeah. i honestly think that that is an incredible model for modern bands i'm freeze does the same thing in fact sometimes at a concert you can get as you go out the door right you can get the recording if you wait a little bit, not anymore. Oh, it used to be. They'd give you a USB key. It, now it takes four hours and then they make it available for download. But they do that. And they stream a lot of stuff. I know John's always running home to watch a stream all the time. Yeah. <laughs> like they're streaming tonight. <laughs> uh, but this way, they, you know, they do they even have a label? I don't think they do. They don't. Do they? Oh, okay. You don't really, you don't. Oh, they own their own label. That's why. You don't really need, you know, Universal Music Group in your back pocket uh anymore in fact i be, i would bet bands like this and fish do better without uh you know if live nation involved if you're if you're a business oriented and you understand what yeah, you're doing you have to know what you're you doing. understand how yeah. to build community fish is uh, you know fish and annie defranco and some of the other folks that have been able to build these these audiences and build these communities you know there's a lot of artists that aren't that that aren't that person, you know, that aren't that group no, that I understands right. how to interact with their audience at a level so that they need labels because the labels are going to set that up and they're going to push it out and they're going to do all the things for them so they can just be an artist and make music. But some of them understand the business model of it or find the business model over time. And and for them, they don't need labels. I mean, I don't think, I think that they could work outside of that pretty quickly, but, you know, even things that we think are TikTok, uh, like were discovered on TikTok might not have been. <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah. There might have been some label label interaction oh, there. To shoot. Sure I that. missed their uh, Cancun concert on uh, Saturday night. That would have been fun. Yeah, it just ended. That that would have four been days. <laughs> oh, man. I would have loved to do that. That sounds like fun. Do you listen to uh, Fish When You Code? Is that good coding music? Oh, it's great. Yeah, yeah, because it's, you know, it's a lot of instrumental. Right. And it's, you know, it's it doesn't like jump out at me if I'm really focused the way like a transition between artists would. Right. Like, you know, if, if you listen to your whole collection on shuffle, you're hearing God knows what. And you'll oftentimes, oh, wait, I don't want to hear this now. Skip, skip, skip. And that takes you out of the zone that you're coding in. Right. So and Fish is also, you know, if I if I put on I've always been like an album person, you know, I start an album, play straight through. And if, you know, with most bands, you start an album, you play through, straight through, you, then you have to make another decision within 30 to 40 minutes. Uh, whereas with Fish, their shows are like three hours long. So if, <laughs> you if, just, <laughs> just start a show and just go and you don't have, then you can focus on whatever you want to focus on and not have to think about changing the music every so often. If you could go to a theater and watch Fish, would you do it? Live. Like a movie theater? Yeah. Live. Um, maybe. I don't know. Probably not. Okay. Uh, and you know, part of what I like about seeing them is they play a lot of outdoor venues. Mm -hmm. um, I, I greatly prefer outdoor venues to indoor ones. I, I almost never want to go to an indoor one. Um, yeah, and, it was really it, smoky for Humphreys. It was just yeah, and I just I was coughing most of the time. Yeah, yeah. I find that very unpleasant. So yeah. that's why, like, I, I just yeah. I like the experience of the outdoor venue. You know, you go in the summer. It's like starts to get cooler at night. You know, you, you nice. see all the smoke billowing up from the crowd and right. none of it's tobacco, but right. you see all of it billowing <laughs> up from the crowd. And But you don't have to smell it constantly. You're not like choking on it right. um, unless it's your own, in which case, you know, that that's up to you. It's up to you. Um, but it's uh, it's it's a I love the outdoor experience. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, frankly, I think it sounds better in most cases, too, uh, yeah. if you are listening to the sound because it's, you know, you have less of the, you know, the echoing and reverberation problems and, you know, the bass doesn't just take it over like you were saying. <laughs> so, it, yeah, I, I'm an outdoor concert. Andy, person. you've gone to cool. opera shows in the movie theaters, though, right? Yeah. Uh, and and by the way, just to, be, just to be clear, we're not talking about a live performance in a movie theater. We're talking about a movie screen the of a live performance. Yeah, they yeah. they uh, some of the bigger the bigger productions they will do like a live simulcast like on a on a Saturday afternoon. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's uh, there's a new production of Longgren uh, from Wagner that I had no interest in until I kept looking at the social media from like the the the, the chorus and the leads and like this looks proficiently weird and wonderful. <laughs> And I can't, and I can't like make the, I can't make the jump. And I'm really like, I'm already like, this will be my first time back in a movie theater, like since COVID, N no joke, because I don't want to miss this. Yeah. Cool. So I, and I take it, Alex, that you're talking to people who are thinking about doing that kind of thing. I may work on that from time to time. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 some pointed questions. Yeah, let there. me know when the Beatles are planning that because I would love, I will go to my <laughs> local uh, theater to see the Beatles. Absolutely. Yep. Wouldn't miss that for the world. Cool. Our show today brought to you by our fine sponsor and my personal mail provider, Fast Mail. Uh, I, there's just no question that if you care about email, you should be paying for it. If you use email for your business, if you, even if you just use it to send your newsletter out, your email, free email, is worth every penny you pay for it. But most of us today still use Gmail and Outlook Mail, all the free. And I think that's nuts. And because, especially because I hear from all the people, we had a caller uh, on Saturday on or Sunday on Ask the Tech Guys, who had gotten his Google account canceled because he uploaded old family videos, cut him off with no recourse. And that's the pro that's one problem number one with free email is you are not a customer. You are the product. That's problem number two. They're, you're, you're giving up your privacy. They're using your email for all sorts of things, for advertising, for figuring out what you're interested in. Free email, and it's just not free. For over 20 years, FastMail has been a leader in email privacy, and I've been using FastMail for more than a decade. I moved off of Gmail. I was an early Gmail uh, user, and I, and I liked it. What I really liked was webmail, but I didn't give up anything because FastMail's webmail is better than Gmail. It's fantastic, but you can also, it's also a very good IMAP. They uh, use an open source server, which they contribute back to called Cyrus. So it's it's the best IMAP out there. In fact, I really like FastMail because they are a big contributor to the email ecosystem with internet standards, open source innovations that other email services, tr you know, try to use because it's the best. 
Fastmail prioritizes your privacy. Your personal data is safe, kept away from third parties with better spam filters, absolutely no ads. All Fastmail data is stored in the U.S. Fastmail is fully GDPR compliant. Uh, and don't, no, don't worry. It's not going to cost an arm and a leg. As little as $3 a month. I have been using Fastmail for more than a decade. I am a huge fan. I use it because... Well, for all those reasons, but also because it's very customizable. It's power email for power users. Sure, just as easy to use as Gmail, but if you decide you want to dig deep, you can do it. With DKIM and uh, all of the authentication protocols, what is SPF, DMARC, so that your mail goes through better. In fact, I use my own domains for my uh, email, and I have those domains uh, the DNS comes from Fastmail, which automatically gives me DMARC and SPF uh, and DKIM automatically. So my email gets it through everywhere. Plus, I can have as many email addresses as I want. So I use, say, Laporte.email. I can have, when I sign up for an account with uh, Instagram, it could be Insta at Laporte.email. Every single, every single account I sign up for is unique. Actually, Fastmail also supports something I really like, which our other sponsor, Bitwarden, does, which allows you to generate unique email addresses for everything you sign up for, which adds to your security. It works with Bitwarden and 1Password. Uh, you can have not only unique passwords for every account, but unique emails for every account. And, and the email still gets through to you. You can organize your inbox with scheduled send. You've got snooze. You've got folders and labels. You have a search bar that's very powerful and very fast. I actually, at this point, I've ported it. My, I no longer use Google for my calendar or my address book or my notes. It all goes through Fastmail. It does CalDAV uh, and uh, uh, CardDAV. So it, it, it's my contacts. It's my, uh, my calendar. I think Fastmail does everything right. They also have the best spam filtering, and they support the Civ language. So I have a very sophisticated Civ. So my email gets organized before I even see it on the Fastmail servers. So I don't miss important mail, and I don't have to look at unimportant mail. And I definitely don't have to see spam. Fastmail's U.S.-based support team aren't just notebook readers. They're full-time email experts. Every time I've talked to them, I've gotten great information. They put you first because you are the customer, not the product. Fastmail believes in working for customers as people to be cared for, not products to be exploited. Advertisers, no, bye-bye. Putting you and your privacy at the center. Fastmail's fast, effective. They're a leader in email. They're the, I would say, the leader in email. And, and frankly, they are the, they are the, barrier the wall to having gmail just take over the world so i like supporting them fastmail rocks is what one user says it's secure private independent has a gmail transfer tool you won't regret this move oh that's right it's very easy to move to fastmail you can even have fastmail and i do this have with one inbox go out and get mail from a variety of providers so you're never going to miss anything it's easy to download your old data and port it into your new fastmail inbox and just as easy to move out if you ever decide to but you won't like I said, 10 years with Fastmail. In fact, I buy three years at a time because I save a little money by doing that because I know I'm going to be a Fastmail customer for the rest of my life. Fastmail. Reclaim your privacy. Boost productivity. Make email yours with Fastmail. Try it free right now for 30 days at fastmail.com slash twit. This, is, this has been my little way of uh, de-Googling my life, and I can't tell you how great it's been. Fastmail dot com slash twit by the way they're also giving twit listeners a 15 percent discount on their first year so make sure you use that address fastmail.com slash twit sign up today don't wait fastmail.com slash twit it is the best you're watching mac break weekly our special uh, ringer guest this week <laughs> marco arment we're expecting you to uh, hit, hit home runs every time you Step up to the plate, Marco. You know, all these sports metaphors suggest <laughs> that you have never actually seen me try to play a sport. <laughs> you could be a ringer without actually putting a glove on, I got to say. That um, kid looks awfully old to be a middle schooler, <laughs> if you ask me. <laughs> Chrome has been tweaked. Uh, it's so, you know, it's kind of a statement that, that Google has to say, oh, uh, we've tweaked Chrome, so it's, it's, it's better. 
uh, <laughs> it's not going to kill your MacBook anymore. Um, that just shows you what well, a bad reputation. As much. As much. <laughs> Do most, what, is the, what are the stats? Do most Apple users use Safari or uh, is Chrome as dominant there as it is everywhere else? It's, it's something like 80 or 90% of the browser usage everywhere else, right? You see those stats, Marco, right? If I collected them, I might. Oh, but you don't. But I don't. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't pay that much attention to web browser stuff anymore. You know, I, I'm a Safari user. I'm very happy with it. And, uh, you know, that's it. But, you know, I I would guess that Chrome probably is the most popular browser on Mac OS. Even on Mac guess. OS. Even with the tyranny of the default. Because you have to download. I recently, I'm embarrassed to say, downloaded Bing on my MacBook. Because I got into the the Bing chat, you know, thing, and I thought, well, I got to play with it. And they say, well, you really need to use Edge. Oh God, really? <laughs> uh, you, but now I guess Edge will benefit too, because this is really an improvement in Chromium, the open source backend to Chrome. The Chromium folks announced this. They say Chrome users can now browse the internet for 17 hours on an M2 MacBook Pro, or watch YouTube for 18 hours on a single charge. Uh, mm. If you've been, what was it before? Yeah, well, I don't. I mean, that's a lot. I certainly think that's enough. It should should be enough, you know. Yeah, I think I saw somewhere it's like a thirty minute gain or something. Which oh, okay, yeah. that's that's a gain, but that's you know, this is kind of like saying like when when Microsoft makes something about Windows better, right? And it's like, well, okay, congrats, good job, you made it better. Uh, <laughs> better than it was, you know. But is it good enough? You know, is the question. There's still, you know, Chrome is never going to prioritize power efficiency as much as Apple does. Right. Uh, they they just it's not it's not a priority for them the way it is for Apple. And so they're always going to treat this as kind of okay. We're going to keep advancing our other initiatives, our other needs, our other priorities, and if we can get some power savings along the way, great. Uh, whereas Apple has a very different focus. You know, Apple is so ruthlessly focused on power efficiency and and you know if there's some you know quote web standard which people throw around a lot when you know they don't necessarily have the cachet <laughs> to do so but if, if there's some proposed standard that is going to destroy power efficiency apple just won't do it or they will wait until they can do it in in you know kind of a, a you know we're gonna we'll give you 80 percent of that and you know take 20 percent of the power kind of way whereas chrome's gonna plow ahead and do whatever they want to do for their purposes so uh but power efficiency is never their top priority so it's nice they're making gains here, but uh, I I wouldn't expect this to be a massive change uh, overall. Yeah, plus plus Google has to support so many operating systems to which they don't have like metal access, uh, and Apple could do so much when they say we want to build we're going to build us we're going to put a Safari processor on, on every piece of Apple Silicon just to make sure that it will just sip 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 power uh, and beat every benchmark you want to throw at it. Uh, if that's important to most, the, the question is going to be. Is that going to be a user facing feature? If it's a small, if it's a small battery advantage, a lot of people are going to be like, but this website works better for me on Chrome, or I like the way that the Chrome, that Chrome syncs bookmarks for me across multiple devices and multiple platforms. So it's catch 22. I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad that people have the choice though. I, uh, I wonder, I mean, the, the one thing though that I would use Chrome for on any platform, I don't use Chrome, but if I were, it would be progressive web apps, um, which Apple has. Are you up on that at all, Marco? Does does over Overcast isn't a progressive web app? It's a stand. It's a it's a real app. Um, I as far as I know, my my web app is terrible. I I I'm not a good <laughs> web front end developer. I, I wasn't ten years ago, and I'm I have not progressed my knowledge since. <laughs> so, like the whole world of all these like you know JavaScript frameworks React and having and, everything, yeah, yeah. 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 I've I, never touched any of that. Yeah. I have no idea how to do it, and I frankly don't care because I'm focused entirely on the native app for the iPhone. And so, and and these worlds are so big now. I used to be able to do both. But now th these worlds are so big, you kind of have to specialize. It's really hard to do to do you know good apps and good web apps. And so I, I've specialized, and so my web credentials are shot. Like whatever I did at Tumblr is long. That that's like ancient <laughs> history. Today I couldn't even be employed as a basic level one web developer anywhere. Did no Tumblr company have a would framework? or should hire me. Was there a framework you guys used, or was it all just kind of JavaScript and HTML or? There was a back end framework, but uh, like for you know for PHP, but for the for the front end, was PHP. this was wow. Oh yeah, of course. Uh, but this PHP is awesome. <laughs> but it's yeah. uh, 
but you know, they, there's on the front end, the, you know, I, I was there from 2006 to 2010. Like this was so far before oh, yeah. what we now think of as a JavaScript framework. Like there was, there were a few utilities. I think Stone jQuery age. came out towards the end of that, but yeah. it, it was, it was the early days. jQuery was a huge breakthrough at the time because it allowed you to not redraw the whole page, but just a little part of the page. And that's what a lot of these frameworks like Angular and React, that's what they're doing. Uh, is a lot of that. So that really was a sea change. But I agree with you. I mean, if you were to try to keep up with web technologies, it would be a full-time job these days because every three months there's something new. Frankly, I don't know how anybody gets any work done. I know. <laughs> like I have, I have a hard enough time keeping up with like one mobile app platform. I don't even do Android. I just do iOS. Right. Even that, keeping up with that is a full-time right. job that I can barely keep up with myself. <laughs> like, I don't know how anybody does the web stuff. Have you have you played it all with the chat GPT related to code? No, I, I, it's one of those things, again, it's on the to-do list, but it's not no, high. I only ask you, like, you don't use Copilot to write Overcast? Come on, man. <laughs> no, it, no, I, the, I, I talked to a lot of programmers and it's not that they use the code, like, gives word, them a, you know, gives them a start you know, line point. for line, yeah. but they go, write this, you know, they'll, they'll ask it to write something and they look at it and they go, oh, yeah, I that it. might be a good yeah. idea. And, and they don't, they don't necessarily cut and paste it into the, into the app, but they, I was just curious because a lot of them have said that it just really speeds up their development. They can... They can hunt around looking for things, or they can just ask. Chat those GPT. are guys working. Doesn't work as well with Swift. Those um, are guys working in a big team, and they are told, yeah. "Okay, you now have to write the log, the login code." And yeah. so yeah. many coders. This is, I mean, you go, you go to Stack Overflow and you say, "Login code," and you, and you copy and paste it. So it's just really kind of more of the same, I think. Marco yeah, seems like automated he, copy and paste. It's, yeah, it's just automated <laughs> copy. Well, Marco, you're more of a hand rolled kind of a guy, I think. Yeah, well, because like, you know, what most programming work in the world is, is fairly tedious. Take this data from here and show mm -hmm. it in this form here. And, you know, it, it's, it's it, you know, we call it the CRUD, you know, the, the acronym. Like, it's just you, you, you're shuffling data around in fairly common uh, repeatable ways that are that are fairly interesting and don't require a lot of like cleverness in what you're doing. And so for that kind of thing, which is again most coding work in the world, it's probably good for that. Um, but yeah, I I'm I don't really work that way for the most part. Obviously, I do have to write some tedious code in my app, but for the most part, I'm doing like you know sh I I write very little code and I think about it really hard. And so yep. most of the time that I am spending coding is not the typing. I don't, mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't know anybody who makes apps the way I do, who spends a lot of time typing. Um, so what it's saving me is not substantial. Whereas where most of my time goes is thinking about what to write and then finding the bugs in what I wrote. And you still have to do that part with ChatGPT generated code. And, and you know, it can give you a head starter. It can give you maybe ideas of, you know, oh, I didn't think to, to do it that way, like you were just saying. But ultimately, that's, it's not going to save me a ton of time the way I work. Well, and, and, and it, we, we had a, I was just in a discussion about this <laughs> yesterday uh, related to code of, you know, I, I consider pretty much React Native and all those things. We tend to call it monkey code. <laughs> like, it's just like, it's it's like a Ruby on Rails. All those things are just kind of like, they're, a, they're an abstract that causes so much instability in our apps that, you know, when you're, you know, it doesn't really work anywhere. It just kind of barely survives it. And um, so usually I, if I'm designing an app, I usually end up, we build it in Swift, we build it in, you know, like, and and then then we hand it off to someone, like, okay, let's make a cross platform. And someone says, let's do React Native. And that's when I, I punch out of the project, you know, <laughs> I'm just like, I don't, like, you guys take that and have fun. And, um, but one of the things we were talking about is that with ChatGPT at some point, not now, but in some point you could say, here's my Swift code and I want, I want native Android code you know, to, to, to push it out and just, you know, or here's what I, here's what I'm trying to do. And it could make eventually some of these kind of these, these structures obsolete because you could just build native code for both sides without having to abstract it to something that isn't as stable. I mean, that's that might pan out that way. I, I hope it does, frankly, because that I think that could be very, really, you know, very productive for society. But we've seen over the course of computing history so many things that promised right ones run anywhere. That, and that that <laughs> seems like another version of that. It is granted a much smarter and it's a very different way of doing that. And so maybe right. there's some promise there. Uh, but ultimately what we find over and over again when we attempt this kind of thing in technology is that there is way more specialization that each platform requires right. and special mm -hmm. consideration and design decisions and feature decisions and right. it's it's very hard to ever actually achieve that in practice yep 
I kind of think of what you do more as uh, almost like woodworking or uh, when I code is like building little machines and, <laughs> uh, and, but that's cause I'm doing it in Lisp. So it's functional. So I think of it as like, I'm building a little box, a little machine. And it's kind <laughs> of, it does almost map to a physical building of things, which I think is more satisfying. <laughs> Yeah, That's I mean, in many ways, it's a luxury, you know, like we, it is we a luxury, are, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, I, I'm very lucky that like my business does not require me to be cranking out huge volumes of code all the time. Right. Most people don't have that choice. Most people have the boss telling them, look, right. you have like the next three days to get this thing done. And then, and it doesn't matter if it's not perfectly polished. We got to ship it then. You got to move on to something else. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's very much a luxury to be able to say, you know what, I'm going to, take the last you know, two weeks and tweak my database engine layer to be to have nicer code at the call site and you know and that no one can tell me no that i'm not allowed to do that and that's that's a luxury most people don't have and i'm, I'm very thankful for it you don't and have that. I, I try to remain like sympathetic to the world of regular programmers who are who have a boss telling them no you can't take 16 hours to do that one little thing you don't have stand-ups with yourself and have little scrums and none of that. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> we got a Kanban board and it's all Marco. Marco does it all. Yeah. He's everything. <laughs> uh, have you had to refactor a hundred percent or are you still uh, using, you know, decisions that you made in the earliest days of overcast today? Oh, I'm still stuck with lots of old stuff that I that I wish I could refactor easily. But, you know, it's, I have a legacy, you know, on, on the server side, I have tons of legacy server side stuff where, you know, just ways I set up the data layer, you know, th the, the structure of the database, you know, what, how, how certain things map, you know, like URLs are one-to-one -one mapped to podcast. And that was a whole thing when everyone started moving their feeds all over the place. Um, you know, so there, you know, there's decisions there. And then on, in the app and in the iPhone app, um, there's tons of old code that's still there and old interfaces are still there that, you know, I'm trying to work through and modernize and move over to Swift and Swift UI and, and async stuff, and all the, all the modern um, APIs and stuff. And, and I'm it's a very slow process because there's just so much legacy and there's stuff like feature and behavioral decisions where, you know, people when when you have an established customer base, it's really hard to change anything without yeah. angering a whole bunch of people. And there are things I would do differently if I if I was starting over with no existing customers uh, to have to carry forward and and to to worry about, you know, what they think of it and, and what they've you know, what they've supported with me over the years. You know, if I didn't have to think about that. Uh, and I was starting fresh, I would do things a little bit differently in certain areas, certain features I wouldn't do at all, certain features I would do differently, um, certain structures around like, you know, streaming, auto deleting, you know, feed management, you know, I would do some of those things differently. Um, but the reality is it's, it's a, it's an app that's almost a decade old. And so I have, I have a lot of customers to bring along with me. And so I had to do things a little more carefully and cautiously and have more things be settings that you can turn off. They always say when you're designing code, thinks, think long and hard about your data structures because you're going to live with them forever. And, yep. uh, and a lot of the code you write is just determined by what you decided at the very beginning on your data. What uh, do, does, Is podcasting a moving target? Uh, there are people, I always get people saying, you should be doing podcasting 2.0, to which I just go, Pfft. but uh, <laughs> yeah, but I, I have. <laughs> how do you respond but, to that? So so similar to what I said earlier about web standards being kind of a squishy a squishy concept, um, I I don't like anybody declaring a new standard uh, in, in some kind of large public way and saying this is the way we're now going to do things. And because what that does is it it presumes that they are correct, it presumes that they have the authority to create such standards, and it presumes that the market wants their standards and that their standards are implementable and easy to do. And and those are all I think unsafe presumptions. And so when something comes along. Like you know the the podcasting 2.0 thing, um, I have nothing against those people. Um, but but the what what has happened is that I now regularly have people you know e either in the worst case leaving bad reviews saying I don't support podcast 2.0 features and therefore I'm being a negligent developer, or people write in saying when will you support feature X Y Z and and which presumes that I'm that I have to support feature X Y Z right. or that I want to support feature X Y Z and and I don't you know I don't like other people dictating my roadmap for me um, or speaking for me or or making these kind of decisions for me. W what I want to do in my app is I want to listen to my customers, what they say and what they need and and what I think is right for them and do that. And and I have my own roadmap for that. And the, the podcast with 2.0 features, I think there's some good ideas there. 
Um, but a lot of it got wrapped up in crypto stuff. And I, and I want, I try to stay far away from that. Um, so there's, there's the whole presumption that I need to, that I need to do crypto stuff. And if I don't do that, then I'm somehow, you know, failing as a developer here. And so I, I try to stay away from that, but also a lot of the, a lot of the things they want to do are are features that already exist in other forms, uh, or features that I that I cannot really imagine the market adopting in in large numbers, and so it makes it hard for me to justify the time. Meanwhile, there's features that my customers have been asking for for years that I'm trying to get to, and those aren't part of these standards because these standards are usually not made by app developers, so they don't they don't have the same feedback loop I have, where I have my customers telling me, "Here's what we actually want." And so I know what I'm supposed to be building. I know how to spend my time. I have my own roadmap and I know exactly what my customers have been wanting for years. And anybody can come along and write a standard and say, all right, here's your new thing. You have to do this. But I, I, I in every case, I'll push back and say, do I? <laughs> I hear, I'm thank you because I hear from people fairly frequently saying, why don't you do chapters, which is one of the features of podcasting 2.0. We can already do that. We've had <laughs> chapters for like 15 years, at least like we, there are so many ways to do chapters. We already, I wrote a tool to do it. The forecast, it's a free app for Mac. You can put chapters in your podcast. You can convert logic markers to chapters. It's great. Any kind of wave marker, it converts it automatically. So you can make it in your editor and it just imports them as chapters. There, it's so easy to do chapters and we already have ways to do that. And so the, the ways we've had forever are it's embedded metadata in the file. First, we had it in, in uh, M4A files, AAC files. Apple made a GarageBand feature to make them forever a million years ago. Um, and then later on, they were added to the MP3 spec. Uh, there, it's an official MP3 ID3 chapter spec. Overcast supports it. Apple supports it. Like all the big podcast apps support that. Um, and so now we have like one of the podcast 2.0 things. Uh, I, I, this is from memory. Forgive me if I have the details wrong. This has been proposed a number of times by a number of different people, but it's basically chapters in the feed. And the right. problem is, in reality, the the world of podcasting uh, is largely now using dynamic ad insertion, which I don't love at all, but I have to deal with it. And so dynamic ad insertion means that any given copy of the file might have different timestamps than any other given copy of the file. So because they might insert ads differently for each download that are different lengths and they do that all the time. So things that are based on fixed timestamps in a feed don't work for most publishers now. Oh, yeah. So if, you, if you're a big publisher and you're using DAI, then you can't use feed based chapters because those timestamps are going to be different for every single person who downloads it. So it has to be embedded in the file or not done at all. Also, frankly, I think it's optimistic to expect those big publishers to ever do chapters <laughs> because big publishers can't even do show notes, right? So, you know, I, I think we're, you know, we're, we're, we have to, we have to ask for minimal things here. Yeah. I'm one <laughs> but, of those yeah, small I, publishers that can't do show notes, right? And we'll never do chapters because it's too much, <laughs> it's too labor intensive. So, but it's not, if you do it as markers in your editor, it's not labor intensive. Okay, you, you just make, use make forecast. Make a note of that, John Ashley. If you just <laughs> drop do a marker, markers you can... in the editor, just do it. To, you know, I don't actually want people skipping around on my podcasts. I want them to listen from the beginning to the end. That's it. Period. Um, yeah, actually, pod, it's really interesting because there's actually a war over podcasting right now, thanks to Spotify and uh, Amazon and iHeart, these big companies who want you to use their client uh, to listen to podcasts, which isn't really a podcast. If it's not RSS, it ain't a podcast, baby. And um, they really make more money that way because they can tell advertisers a lot more about you. And I'm resisting that, but I'm wondering if uh, in the long run, uh, this is uh, resistance is futile. Well, it depends what you're going for. You know, the podcasting has always since its inception, has always been under attack by people who wanted to lock it down into proprietary silos. And for most of podcasting's life, we didn't really have to worry about that because they always just failed miserably. Really, uh, until Spotify, that that was the one that really like worked and took a big chunk out for the first time. Um, but even that, I think, because I think we are seeing its limits. Now. Spotify's, and, yeah, it's interesting. They're saying, whoops, we spent too yeah. much money. It, 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 it didn't work. <laughs> And yeah. I couldn't and, and be so, happier. <laughs> yeah, me too, honestly. And and so, you know, I, I think if you if you look at what podcasting is and, and and has always been, we have this whole world of the of shows like ours that are in the open ecosystem that have RSS feeds. You can get in any app, play whatever app you want, you can get our show. Um and that world, there's no reason that world will be forced not to exist. Unless there, I think I think the one big like species-ending event for that world would be 
if sponsors no longer bought ads in that format, that could be damaging to us. But what we've well, seen over and over again, happen, I hate to say it's depressing. Well, it's becoming more difficult, maybe. But I think what we've seen over and over again is that this medium, the way we do it with having good relationships between us and the listeners and doing direct host reads, uh, oftentimes that that works very, very well for direct response advertisers. And that's why we keep getting the same advertisers over and over again. And they give us the coupon code that has our show name in it and they can measure how many conversions they get. And they can see, oh, our ads are actually working for them. They're making money from us and they buy ads again. That, that works because people listen to our shows in this format and people trust us and like us to some, or at least some of them do. And, uh, and so that works for us. And so whatever happens over there in Spotify land where they have some big exclusive celebrity based show and they try to get people to move over. First of all, I, I think that is proving not to be very effective for them, uh, for the numbers, for either the the shows that become exclusive and lose all their audience um, or for Spotify trying to keep people in and, not, and get new listeners. It, that So far, I think that's showing not to work as well as they want it to. But whatever happens over in worlds like that, as long as we keep the relationship with our audience healthy and we keep producing shows like ours, there is nothing that's going to come and, and take this away. This it's it's decentralized. It's the web. It, it's based on the web. Uh, so same thing with Mastodon I think, I think on Twitter, are, right? You can no yeah. billionaire can come along and buy Mastodon, right? Like I, I think we are we are fairly. I would I wouldn't say we're safe forever. Nothing is safe forever in in tech or the world. Uh, but I, I think we have pretty strong defenses in, in in open podcasting. You can you can look at how many attacks there have been over time, and how we are very resistant to change, and and we are we we defend against these attacks extremely effectively, um, because just just by the way that our medium has always worked, and the way our audience wants things to be. You know, nobody likes to be told to use a different app for one or two shows than the app they prefer to use. Nobody likes to be told that they can't get their podcast where and how they want them, and so it's our job to keep making good stuff over here in this open world, and we can in that way we can largely ignore what happens in the silos. Uh, listen to Marco, everybody <laughs> from your mouth, uh, to Procter and Gamble's ear. The, the biggest problem we've had is, uh, is, uh, advertisers, uh, preferring this other format, this direct ad insertion and, uh, preferring, um, you know, all the information they get from Spotify and audible and so forth. And, uh, and it makes it harder for us to sell ads. We've lost a lot of advertisers, uh, to that, but you're right. The advertisers who really use, uh, use us and use the host red ads and, and, you know, the offer codes they've, they've done, you know, that's why we do have people over and over again uh, with us. The problem, the other problem that's happened is there's so many uh, podcasts that aren't so good and don't work so well for advertisers. And a lot of times we'll get advertisers who say, Oh yeah, we tried podcasting. It was, it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, okay, what can we do? What can we do? We uh, we're going through, I don't know about you, Marco, and I don't know what you've heard from other podcasters, uh, but we're going through an advertising uh, downturn that is, existential it's life-threatening oh yeah it our our it's not that bad for our show but it's it's this is the worst ad market we've seen in probably a few years yeah um but i, I you know one thing that we did on atp uh, a couple of years ago is we added memberships and so we yes. have we've diversified so into we. that and yep. <laughs> that's i i'm so happy we did that because that that makes it a lot easier to take it when the ad market is down like this you know it's because yeah. the memberships you know ultimately i don't think they're ever going to replace the ads just numbers wise ads just pay more. Uh, but it's really nice to have this backstop, you know, when the ad market is is terrible as it is now. But, you know, I, I, one thing we've seen that kind of gives me hope is that the ad market throughout, I mean, geez, how long have I been podcasting? Uh, 10, 11, 12 years. Uh, the ad market is cyclical. It always has been. It has its ups and downs. This is a down. It's down for everybody. But I don't think that says podcast advertising is in trouble. I think that that's, I think what we're seeing is that in general, Advertising right now is down everywhere. Yeah. Um, but yeah. that you know, but it goes in cycles. And during the boom times, you know, we we don't say, "Hey, advertising is suspiciously great right now." No, we just <laughs> we just cast the checks, right? <laughs> yes, so that's true. <laughs> you know, it, it, and we we have very short memories. Uh, so I I think it's it's just important to to realize when you when you look at you know the graph over time of your ad income, like yeah, it has ups and downs. It always does, and and this is. It, it, this is normal. This is normal behavior. And it, it, when you're at the bottom of the down, it might feel like the world's never going to come back, but it will eventually. 
good. Tell that to my ad team, okay? <laughs> Actually, we have a we have an unusual problem because foolishly we built something that has a uh, high overhead, and uh, I mean we have a two and a half million dollar a year uh, nut. So we don't have the luxury of saying, well, if advertising's down, we'll just weather it and and go through it. Thank goodness that we did do that, and I I think everybody who's in podcasting for real understands that the only thing that keeps podcasting alive is the community, the listeners, the people who you have a relationship, a direct relationship with and, and clubs, Patreons, that kind of thing really give, uh, not only give you the little extra income, but they make a big difference in, in bonding the audience to you. So we, two years ago, we created club twit and that was, that was a huge part of it, but it's still, I mean, it's still, uh, one tenth of one percent or something. Maybe it's I would love if I get five percent of the audience to subscribe, we wouldn't need advertisers. But right now it's not even one percent. Most people who are getting something for free aren't going to start suddenly paying for it, I'm afraid. And that's a that's a problem. We don't maybe we don't have as many devoted listeners as Accidental Tech Podcast. But if you are devoted, twit.tv slash club twit. <laughs> seven bucks. Seven bucks a year. That is a month. That's all. Seven bucks. Ad free versions. All the shows. You get the Discord, which is a lot of fun. Uh you get uh you know, extra stuff like, you know, that we do in between shows. I know I'm a terrible salesman. That's the other problem. You, can, you can't even get a good burger for seven bucks. You can't. What else are you going to do with it? You can't. Money? What are you going to get for seven bucks? Might as well just give it to us. Yeah. <laughs> Twit.tv slash uh, club twit. We also, I mean, we do things, Marco, that are obviously crazy, like stream live video as we're, as we're doing the shows. I mean, that adds huge amounts of complexity and cost to the thing. It's I don't know how you do it. Like I, I've I've tried doing video a handful of times in in various ways, and every time I come away from it thinking, like, first of all, a, I've learned how to make pretty great audio for my purposes. I cannot make even remotely good video, so that's problem number one. I'm <laughs> terrible at it, but it's just it's also it's as you know, it adds such oh, a degree of complexity and cost. It's yeah. so. It is so much harder and more expensive and more people intensive than making audio. Uh, and it's, yeah, to, it, I, I've decided a long time ago, like I, video is not for me. I'm yeah, just not going to no. <laughs> let me tell you, it's that's, that's a strong decision. It's, I can strongly recommend it. Yeah. If anybody asks me, I say, don't, A, don't get into podcasting for the money and B, never, ever do video. But if you do it, <laughs> the advantage of it is there is this connection, even from, you know, 80 or 90% of our audience is never going to, or does not look, download the videos. I shouldn't say is never going to look at them because I think, you know, one in 10, times they'll maybe download a video and so they have in their mind this sense of place and sense they know what you all look like and stuff like that and i think that does also build that bond that is so important to podcasting is the is the relationship hey everybody it's leo laporte the founder and host of many of the uh, twit podcasts i don't normally talk to you about advertising but i want to take a moment to do that right now uh, our mission statement at twit we're dedicated to building a highly engaged community of tech enthusiasts, that's our audience, and you, I guess, since you're listening, by offering them the knowledge they need to understand and use technology in today's world. To do that, we also create partnerships with trusted brands and make important introductions between them and our audience. It's how we finance our podcasts, but it's also, and our audience tells us this all the time, a part of the service we offer, it's a valued bit of information for our audience members. They want to know about great brands like yours. So can we help you by introducing you to our highly qualified audience? And boy, you get a lot with advertising on the Twit Podcasts. Partnering with Twit means you're going to get, if I may say so humbly, the gold standard in podcast advertising. And we throw in a lot of valuable services. You get a full service continuity team supporting everything from copywriting to graphic design. I don't think anybody else does this or does this as well as we do. You get ads that are embedded in our content that are unique every time. I read them, our hosts read them. We always over deliver on impressions. And frankly, we're here to talk about your product. So we really give our listeners a great introduction to what you offer. We've got onboarding services, ad tech with pod sites. That's free for direct clients. We give you a lot of reporting so you know who saw your advertisement. You'll even know how many responded by going to your website. We'll also give you courtesy commercials that you can share across social media and landing pages. We think these are really valuable. People like me and our other hosts talking about your product sincerely 
uh, and informationally. Those are incredibly valuable. You also get other free goodies, mentions in our weekly newsletter that's sent out to thousands of fans. We give bonus ads uh, to people who buy a significant amount of advertising. You'll get social media promotion too. But let me tell you, we are looking for an advertising partner that's going to be with us long term. Visit twit.tv slash advertise. Check out our partner testimonials. Tim Broom, founder of IT Pro TV. They started IT Pro TV in 2013, immediately started advertising with us, and grew that company to a, a really amazing success. Hundreds of thousands of ongoing customers. They've been on our network for more than 10 years, and they say, and I'll quote Tim, we would not be where we are today without the Twit Network. That's just one example. Mark McCrary, who's the CEO of Authentic, uh, he was actually uh, one of the first people to buy ads on our network. He's been with us for 16 years. He said, and I'm quoting, the feedback from many advertisers over those 16 years across a range of product categories is that if ads and podcasts are going to work for a brand, they're going to work on Twit shows. I'm proud to say that the ads we do over deliver, they work really well because they're honest they have integrity our audience trusts us and we say this is a great product they believe it they listen our listeners are highly intelligent they're heavily engaged they're tech savvy they're dedicated to our network and that's partly because we only work with high integrity partners that we have thoroughly and personally vetted i approve every single advertiser on the network if you're ready to elevate your brand and you've got a great product, I want you to reach out to us. Advertise at twit.tv. So I want you to break out of the advertising norm, grow your brand with host-read authentic ads on twit.tv. Visit twit.tv slash advertise for more details or email us, advertise at twit.tv if you're ready to launch your campaign now. Anyway, back to Mac, back to Apple. Uh, I'm sure we have something else to talk <laughs> Blood glucose. Blood glucose. Blood glucose. This is very interesting. This is a rumor, but Apple, first of all, uh, we, we're learning that Apple has this group, this XDG group that is working on, it's essentially uh, like Google's um, moon Moonshots, the Project X stuff. And one of the rumors that Mark Gurman has, so I, I'm going to give it some credence, is that Apple is getting close to doing non-invasive uh, blood glucose monitoring. There are f something like 40 million type 1 and type 2 diabetics in the United States who have to monitor the blood sugar level. And uh, right now we do it. I'm a type 2 diabetic. We do it with finger pricks, which is really annoying. Or we wear, uh, you know, those little discs. I've been, uh, For a long time I wore those little uh, discs. They're still invasive, but they're not as bad as a finger prick a continuous glucose monitor, uh, it would be not only a lifesaver for so many people to have non-invasive blood glucose monitoring on your wristwatch, uh, it would be a big pile of money for Apple. <laughs> according, according to German, they are in proof of concept stage. This has been something that's been going on for a long time. And this is coming out of that XDG or Exploratory Design Group. I'm going to guess this has been going on as long as the watch has existed. Yeah, remember yeah, uh, Tim deal. Cook uh, kind of alluded to it years ago, like, oh, my watch, and I'm uh, at like, least right at, at least at least 2010. Steve Jobs made uh, directed the purchase of I can't remember the name of the company, but it was a, it was a company that was working specifically on this technology, not on generalized health, but specifically on technology for spectrometry for blood glucose glucose monitoring. Huge. There is apparently the way they're doing it is uh, there's a, a chip that can do spectroscopy, <laughs> believe it or not. You know, we already have lights in the back of our Apple Watch that's uh, looking at blood flow and things like that. That's how it measures a heart rate. You've seen that green light coming off of the back of your watch probably uh, at night. Well, imagine uh, another beam going into your arm uh, and doing spectroscopy, which is basically analyzing the component elements of your blood for glucose. Uh, that is pretty impressive. Remember, though, that this is a life or death proposition for many diabetics. So you can't get it wrong. You can't be inaccurate. Yeah. Uh, you pr almost certainly have to get FDA approval. Uh, before you Absolutely. can do this, right? And it would probably it, 
go, go but, ahead. Andy. I'm sorry, but but if the FDA a few years ago did create a new fast track program to encourage this kind of tech, these kinds of tech, technologies, so it won't take as long as you might think to get this approved if they can deliver the goods. But it is a huge, huge problem. Of uh, the, I was reading a whole bunch of research papers uh, last week when this uh, when this became a th- another thing to refresh my memory and. It's still conditional on they don't uh, the uh, it, this this kind of technology is conditional upon what color skin do you have how much melanin do you have uh, it's how many tattoos upon, you have on your if you're sleeved that, it doesn't work as well right that too it's right right, right now I I think the 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 basic the the basic idea is that it wouldn't be good enough for uh, for a type one diabetic to monitor their bl- their blood sugar level because that is a life or death thing it would be very used they they could v- soon create something that's useful for people who are let's say pre-diabetic or don't realize they have blood sugar problems to get the sort of warnings that apple gives you for like ekgs which is not saying here is your ekg here is what your heart is doing right now it says hey i'm look, i'm seeing data that i have not typically seen before in the past two months of you watching this watch maybe you want to bring this up with your doctor the next time or let's let's trigger this into other factors that we're also monitoring to give you some not even necessarily a specific advice which the fda would regulate but basically give you awareness of a sensor that says that's giving you a thumbs up or a thumbs down i suspect that's probably you're right the first use um there are companies i, I was i i uh, i have a account with a company called nutrisense that uh, athletes use uh bodybuilders anybody who wants to look at their blood glucose levels not because they're problematic but because they want to have improved performance um i you know i was a friend uh, played uh, high school and college uh, women's softball, and their whole team wore these CGMs because it was useful for their training. Um, so I, I think, think there I is think a market for this that is goes beyond just health monitoring. There's a big market, and and if uh, I think that in the food market, this is this could potentially, as it grows, become devastating as people start to realize. Oh, oh, that's killing you. What happens to that? <laughs> well, when I eat that, when they start seeing spikes, there's oh, all kinds yeah. of things that. When they start seeing what's happening to their yep. blood level, their 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 sugar levels based on what they're eating, you they're going to stop eating the things that, I mean, some people will not care, but there's a lot of people. Once you have that watch, once you see the graph, um, you know, you, you know what you don't measure what matters. What you measure matters. Yep. <laughs> so when you start yep. measuring it, you start paying attention to it, and you start to, um, and and people will start to you know, get into that. I mean, people, it pays attention to how much gas you're using when you're driving and people start right. to change my behavior when right. I see that. Right. Like it changes how I, how I use the gas. Cause I'm trying to get the most and just, just out of, for no reason, like other than just, it's a, it's a, it's a challenge, you know? And, you know, yeah. and, um, and so at the same time, I think people, you'll see people starting to get, if they, if everybody can put it on their wrist or a lot of people can put it on their wrist, you're going to suddenly see a lot of people eating in a certain way that tries to manage that into a, a much tighter band than what it what it was before because up until now they're completely unconscious to it unless you're diabetic you have no idea what's going on with your with your blood yeah. lo- your sugar levels i think that's spot on think of all the times that you've seen on social media people posting uh their heart rate uh, graph off their off their apple watch in a funny way saying aha try to get try to guess what time today my uh, my partner told me that we're having a baby and you see right. this one spike <laughs> and, yeah. and you know and and you and you were and you don't notice at the time but you see oh wow that's isn't that cool that my my pulse went up to 112 just on getting this incredibly great news and i think that that's exactly the same thing if it doesn't tell you here is here is your here is the number uh here is the the number for your uh, uh for your blood 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 glucose uh, right now in an instant read if it tells you that hey remember how you kind of felt like crap around three o'clock and you see that graph and you realize oh there was a spike around that time i ate that entire box of marshmallow peeps maybe maybe i should not be doing that thing uh that's that's just as that's well, that could be just as transforming as, as a lot of other things and it's worse than peeps because I, I know i happen to know that if i have more than like two pieces of bread, I, I have to go to bed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like I just go to sleep. Oh, yeah. so, so Everybody this, knows this, this, the peeps are loaded with sugar, but there's stuff you're eating that's loaded with sugar you don't know, like your exactly. peanut butter. And, yeah, uh, exactly. and and you suddenly see those spikes. I, I, I wore uh, CGM for months, and it is it is eye-opening, and it does change your yeah. behavior. But or the, even, it, so, so even even eating a lot of rice, it's like I had rice, a big bowl pasta, of rice. Okay, well, that yep, yeah, exactly. Yep, it's like, yep. oh, that's not I thought I was eating healthy, but it turns out that it was really yep, spiking my blood yep. sugar for some reason. Uh, yeah. But you also learn other things like you can eat certain things or, for instance, taking a short walk after you eat. There's all sorts of interesting tweaks you mm-hmm. can make to your uh, lifestyle. Um, it's, and, it's fascinating. So I think this, this is going to sell 
a, a oh, yeah. ton of watches. And you got to think it's kind of Moonshot's an apt analogy for this because it's like a space race. Uh, just look at the lawsuits between LiveCore and Apple over their EKG monitors. Apple has got to have the utmost secrecy on this because, you know, uh, you know, Abbott and Dexcom, the makers of those CGM monitors, they're, they've they got spies in Cupertino trying to look over the hedges. What is Apple doing? They would like to do this. If Apple does it, actually, the stock prices for both companies went down 3% when this rumor came out in Bloomberg. Uh, if Apple does this, it, 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 it changes everything. But forget the business angle on this. It is huge for health. And yeah. it would be uh, well, and, amazing. And, and and Cook has talked about that. Cook has said the biggest impact we're going to make is on health. And and when he said it, it was like, really? <laughs> that's, 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 yeah, that's well, we've talked about this. What are the tent poles for huge. Apple in the next generation of Apple? Mm -hmm. Is it a VR headset? Is it a VR, AR with your earbuds? Is it a car? Or is it health? And I think health is the is the absolutely absolute one to bet on right now. Yeah, and I'm using I'm using right now. I'm trying to trying to get get rid of all the COVID weight that I picked up, and um, <laughs> and uh, started do, doing the Apple Fitness stuff. You know, and That's it's great, just isn't the it? fact that it's yeah, oh, you got it on an iPad and it's tied into your yeah. into your watch, and it's you know the whole thing is like you're like oh this is this. I've been doing well. the rowing. Uh, yeah. it's it, you row a lot harder when there's you know somebody cracking the whip, <laughs> and yeah. they're really well done. They're very uh, they're very good, and the fact that your watch goes right up on the screen. Or on your iPad. I watch it on the TV with an Apple TV. Uh, when as someone who's like a snob, great. a horrible snob about production value, like like I have a hard, oh I have God. a hard time. Through I can't roof. even listen to NPR. Like if someone does a call in, I'm like, okay, I can't listen to this anymore. <laughs> and um and uh, so the fact that it that Apple does what it does with the yeah. the fitness stuff, I'm like, oh, I can watch this, and, and I even feel more inspired because the video and the audio is so good. It's interesting because I also <laughs> so, do Peloton. They don't yet have the st Peloton has a couple of uh, trainers who are so engaging. That they that you watch because of them. I don't think Apple yet has. I don't know. Maybe I haven't seen all of them. Have you found somebody in a fitness plus that go? You go. Oh, I'm just going to no, take their bounce class. around. Yeah. No, I just bounce around. I'm like, I think it's Apple, more about what I'm taking. Apple doesn't else. want that. They don't want to spike. They want it. They chop the heads of all, all the daisies because they want them all to be the same height. And uh, and that's where they're all really good. And they they're good. They're really it's good. not that they're, they're bad. really good at diversity. I mean, Apple's got all backgrounds and all things yeah. and they're they're making sure that you have all the you know it's, it's, well every it's one really, of them uses sign asl when they sign yeah. on and sign off um yeah. which is a little performative to me i think they, they're pretty committed to it <laughs> it's it's yeah, it's definitely whole, a, yeah, accessibility thing. at apple is a religion yeah. okay. like it's it is not it's not like they, they don't I, it's one of the few companies i don't think they do it to look good they do it because from the very top down they are um very, very intense about about accessibility and, and inclusion. According to uh, German, Apple's taking a different approach to those con continuous glucose monitor patches, uh, which, by the way, you have to replace every two weeks. They're using a chip technology known as silicon photonics, and I think they acquired this, by the way. I think there's a company they acquired. And a measurement process called optical absorption spectroscopy uses lasers to emit specific wavelengths of light into an area below the skin not your blood. It's looking at interstitial fluid, substances that leak out of capillaries that can be absorbed by glucose. The light is then reflected back to the sensor in a way that indicates the con the concentration of glucose. This is hard to do. Remember, Google had, uh, was it Verily? They were doing the contact lenses, and they shut it down. They couldn't do it. Or, you know, with Google, you never know. Maybe the engineers well, got bored and moved on. I don't know. You, 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 yeah, you talked about a hard contact lens with uh, with uh, uh, radio created power and uh, and sensors built into it. That well, that's that is point. an order of that's an yeah. order of magnitude more difficult than strap this thing on the wrist. I'd, I'd be even you know I'd be even interested if Apple decided to go with a big break and say that you know what this is important enough and interesting enough to us that we are going to create a complementary sensory band. Uh, that has its own battery, has its own sensor pack that can communicate with your phone and your Apple Watch. So yes, you'll be watch, you'll be either wearing something on two wrists, or you'll be having this other thing that's on a watch band. Because uh, if the if the limiting factor is how do we get all of this into uh, an Apple Watch form factor? How do we get into a form factor where it doesn't kill the battery in three or four hours? And they can solve that by saying, here is a stylish, just plastic band, so to speak, uh, that is on your on your alternative wrist. And we can deliver these kinds of things like in 2024 instead of uh, instead of 2027. That would be interesting. 
Tiffany is uh, a uh, extreme athlete, isn't she, Marco? I'm trying to remember. <laughs> I mean, I, I wouldn't describe either of us as extreme oh, athletes okay. <laughs> or even necessarily athletes, but we, you know, we exercise. Oh, good. Okay. No, you know what? I'm confusing you with uh, uh, the Adam Angst. Adam Angst. Yeah, his wife. He, they're both crazy. Uh, <laughs> you know. They make extremes. us look terrible. Yeah, they, they should, make us they look should, bad. They should. I, I wish. I wish they, he could use a zoom filter of like sullen, <laughs> of, <laughs> of, of like of like load. So it's just so so it doesn't look quite so much like like I'm slacking off as much as I am. I uh, howler. I get my heart rate up by watching uh, Formula One Drive to Survive. That keeps me uh, that keeps new me season, exercising. Yes. Isn't that exciting? I tell you, I'm excited. Um, some schools have banned Apple watches. According to Inc., I don't know. I don't like this headline. Schools are banning the Apple Watch. Is it time to ditch yours at the office? What? <laughs> what? Uh, sure. What? Got me to click, Clickbait. Jason Aiton. What? What are you talking about? Inc. 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 has a lot of clickbaity stuff. I almost I almost don't even notice it when there's a headline that has Inc. Uh, attached to it. Okay, they're, good. They're, they're, the, they're, they're the king of Tim Cook always does these three things yeah, every morning. Should you? That. And it's like, okay. As soon as you're promoted on Twitter, I stop reading you. Let's just, I'm not going to tell you that right now. As soon as yeah, I, I mean tried that. out the, um, that new artifact app by the Instagram people. Yeah. What'd you think? And I, 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 yeah, I'm still, I'm still trying it, but I've been using yeah. it for maybe five, six days. And the, the main problem I'm having is content on the web sucks. Yeah. Like, I keep, it's so bad. Like I, I, all the headlines are those like clickbaity headlines and I'm, I'm having a very hard time finding good quality material in there even and i try and you know i try not to feed the algorithm bad data like if it's something really clickbait like that i won't even click on it well that's you know, the question but, is it getting better because it's supposedly learning from it does, you, right it, it does it does get better mm -hmm. i've had it since the, i've had it for a few weeks uh, since the early trial and it does get very very good my problem with it is that it does the most annoying thing about apple news which is like oh great there's a there's a great story i want to open it in chrome so i can bookmark it elsewhere and no it wants to keep it inside this app well okay well at least you're okay well it's a sharing panel so i can share no it'll give you a url that will open it within the that. app i really uh -huh. and it's like it's same it problem it, with apple news i hate that that's not acceptable yeah, and yeah and my and like uh, like 70 percent of my day is doing research and keeping up with news and being, okay that's something i want to follow up on if i can't take it out of your app i can't use your this app. is analogous to our podcast discussion this is that move away from RSS news and shareable links to in-app listening, reading, whatever. Marco, do you use an RSS reader? Yeah, I use them both. I've, I've, I, I never stopped using an RSS reader. <laughs> like I've, <laughs> I've been using them the whole time. Um, I currently use uh, ReadKit on the desktop and Unread on, the, uh, on iOS. And they're both excellent. There's also a Net Newswire, which I bounce in and out of. Um, you know, I was different glad devices. to see them come back. That's great. Yeah, that's yeah. it's a great project. I, yeah. I love that Newswire. Uh, no, ours ours this is great, and it's never stopped being great. You know it, and and in fact, you know what what people love, like you know some of the reviews I get for Overcast are are people basically decrying algorithmic feeds and saying they're happy they found a podcast app that is just what they subscribe to. Like it just here's a list of shows. I want to see every episode they release. And that <laughs> yes. used to be that's that's what RSS does for the web. Yeah. RSS yeah. is that, and we've gotten so far away from that in most consumer applications that that is refreshing to people. And and yep. it's kind of it's kind of sad that most people don't even know that this whole thing has has been here the whole time in both web and podcasting. Like it's it, people don't realize how how good they could have had it all these years but at least at least we're coming around now it never died even though uh, everybody thought it was dead after google reader went away and it never yep. died i i use i use reader several hours a day uh, and partly it's because of just what uh, what marco was saying R don't, don't give me curation -E -E yeah R E E D R. Thank you. Uh, don't don't give me curation. Give me timeline. Just give me the fire right. hose. Let me figure out how to tame that down if I need to. But uh, it's you know, Marco's it, point it is well was... taken. Even if you're using that, you still get just like an artifact. There's too much link bait. Here's here's my top two stories from Artifact. This high speed train goes underwater to connect London to Amsterdam directly. And this tiny smartphone accessory gives you a fantastic superpower. Those are the top two headlines. And then Patrick Warburton is done apologizing for Family Guy. 
I don't know. It might have been something you see. Like mine is Zelensky fires top Ukrainian military. See, that's um, a good. Commander. That's real. So maybe it's me. Okay. Well, this I is, keep this getting is, stuff from something called the Matador. Matador. I don't know what Supreme the Matador Court singles is. skepticism in Biden's effort. Like okay. those, those are my top ones. Okay. I, see, I think I should, what you chose. I need to. I need well, to fix my. Let, let, me, let me give you mine. Fa mine, my just a, this the top screen here is Fast Company. ClickUp wants to be your AI powered productivity super hub. ZDNet. Uh, this smart one effects three gives you a fantastic superpower. Power. Okay, yeah, you that's got the same one as me. Yeah, yeah, that's easy, Mashable. Yeah. Android is adding a ton of new features to your phone. Supreme Court signal skepticism on Biden's Biden's Biden effect. Yep. yep. Albert Pla Okay, Aubrey Plaza looked seriously angry on stage at the SAG Awards, and fans think they've worked out why. <laughs> that's Link Fate. <laughs> okay. Aubrey, Aubrey, she looks. Aubrey, she looks she cranky she looks all, the all the time. All the time. Exactly. That's, 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 that's her, her thing. That's her brand. Oh, yeah. Exactly. In the in White Lotus, she's like pissed off the whole season. It's every it's it's every thing she's in. Like that's her. She's got RBF. That's why. And I. Whoa. Peru police find pre-Hispanic mummy in ex-delivery man's bag. <laughs> the, phys, phys, that's physics out. Phys. See, the problem is you click on those and then you get more of them. That you, you have to. It's the TikTok oh, principle. That, like, damn right, I'm clicking on TikTok, on, that one. on TikTok, like <laughs> I have I have a bunch of different accounts on different phones on TikTok, and I'm like, this phone is the is the how to phone. This is the comedy phone. Yeah, you should be this very careful. Phone. Yeah, like I have I have one phone that you pretty much to. will deliver you. Um, what is the the new meme that has uh, Nick Cage in it? You know, in in TikTok, it's the you know the um. Uh, there's one where it's from the unbearable likeness of great or unbearable likeness, likeness of, of greatness. Of, yeah. of, no, no, not being. That's the old one. The oh. greatness is the, new, the one with Nick Cage. And, oh, the and new Pedro one. Yes, yeah, hysterical. Where he goes like this with his ring into his fist and yeah. well, but yeah. but there's 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 a meme where it's it's Nick Cage looking really upset and it cuts over to Pedro Pascal. He's he's got this like crazy look on his face and it's like <laughs> and so it's always like um you know. Uh, new hire realizing that this this office is crazy and it cuts over to Pedro Pascal and it's like the whole office already knowing that. Like, like we already know it's crazy and and uh but i have one that just delivers that but if i get something else i immediately go through it i'm like i don't want to change the the this this phone is this algorithm like you can't don't don't start moving i'm oh, looking yeah. i'm looking through know that meme and i know you're mean unfortunately there's a lot That's of it. nicholas cage uh <laughs> there's there's the look <laughs> this one this one yeah, here yeah, it's how to it get burned yeah, this one it, 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 the, the, there's there's 10,000 of them. Oh, 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 oh I'm the sorry. They got it. Oh, you okay. had it there. I don't know what it is, but it's like 10,000. There's 10,000 of these <laughs> on the meme. I mean, like it's, but it's like. It's a, <laughs> is that from the same movie or two different movies? <laughs> no, it's the same movie. It's the same clip. It cuts or it cuts over to it. And it's just, it's used like, um, but yeah, I trained, I trained one TikTok instance to just, just give you those for half an hour and watch those. It's so much fun. <laughs> This is just shows you know your meme is no longer au courant because everybody's moved to TikTok, so forget it. You know, yeah. it's not these meme generators anymore. Uh, boy, you made me think of something I wanted to bring up, but I don't remember what it is. So it's asking me to invite my friends to um, Artifact, Renee Ritchie, Jason Calacanis, Esther Dyson. <laughs> <laughs> well, it thinks I know some people. Um, I do know Renee Ritchie. Let's see. What else? What else is going on here? Um, I, EU. EU, shmeu. Who cares? EU is going after Apple. I don't, you know, that's going to. This is, uh, this is uh, almost as good as finding a 5,000-year-old uh, Peruvian dummy, uh, mummy in your uh, mailbag. <laughs> A woman who got locked out of her Apple account minutes after her iPhone was stolen had $10,000 taken from her bank account, and she says Apple was not helpful at all. It's too long to be link bait, and it's a true story, and actually it's a cautionary tale. It happens on Android as well. These phones that uh, unlock with a PIN will give you a chance to change your password once you're in, right? So this is a Wall Street Journal story. Um, it's about how iPhone thieves lock people out of their Apple accounts by using their passcodes to access the phone before changing the device's password and then, you know, stealing funds from the account and so yeah. forth. This is a it's Joanna a, it's a Stern story. It's a specific and personal attack where they basically watch someone who's using their phone, wait for them to unlock it, and then just grab it and run. And during those oh, minutes that the phone it. is unlocked. So they're looking over they, your shoulder at a bar or whatever. You unlock your phone. 
Then like they like Kanye did they, when he was they, in they the Oval minutes, Office. Yeah. Kanye, we know that Kanye's yeah. <laughs> pin was what? Zero, 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 right? So it's like just like that. You look over at somebody's office, uh, oh, shoulder in the bar or wherever, and now you got their pin. Then you steal their phone because now you can get in. Oh, but it, it, was, it wasn't even stealing the pin. It was literally just grab it and run while it's still unlocked. While it's unlocked. And okay. Yeah, exactly. So it, so while it's unlocked, then you're basically free to change the change the passcode so that the person can't, assuming they can get their hands on a, on another phone anyway, they can't lock out your you can't lock out the account. And in that time, they have plenty of time to access banking uh, banking apps uh, or anything else like that. Well, no, so they, it's not, the whole the whole here is they do get the passcode. They they so watch they, you. They shoulder. Yeah, they watch you. They oh, get the safe. passcode, yeah. and then and then the 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 kind of shocking revelation here that I think a lot of us techies didn't know. I certainly didn't. Is that That's with an need. iPhone, if you if you have the physical possession of the phone and you and you know its passcode, you can reset the Apple ID password. Okay. Sorry. And then that then you have everything because then you have the Apple ID, you have a phone that's trusted by the Apple ID, you have anything that's locked by Face ID or Touch ID, you have the passcode, and you can change the passcode. So you can and then you you can. Log into iCloud with the Apple ID. You can kick all their other devices out. You can change the password. So that it's that loophole of be, being able to turn a passcode and a phone into an Apple ID that I think I, I didn't know that was even possible. Sorry, missed, and there's no way to turn that off. And yeah. and it's uh, incidentally the same on, on Android phones. Uh, yes. And, and, and increasingly, this is becoming your proof that you are you. Your 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 device. Uh, and that's because of biometrics. Now, if you own, now obviously you can't turn off a passcode. You can't use biometrics without a passcode. But if you had a modern iPhone that used Face ID, you'd be you wouldn't have to worry as much because you're not going to be entering the passcode in public, right? Most of the time, let's I mean, hope. And this is, I, I think, what this teaches us is that we have to treat the passcode to our phone the same way we would treat yeah. a password to our Apple ID account right. because you can turn one into the other, and so. You know, it, you shouldn't you shouldn't have somebody looking over your shoulder easily when you're typing in your Apple ID password. Well, you, you need to treat your phone's passcode with that same level of physical in-person security of, you know. So first of all, you might want to consider an alphanumeric passcode. You can where it actually works like a password in that way. Um, but, and if not, if you're going to stick with numeric, at least be very careful when you're entering it. Like look around you, like make sure no one is looking over your shoulder or can easily see it. You know, if you have to hold the phone close to your chest or, you know, go kind of duck away somewhere to do it, that's worth doing because if somebody has your Apple ID and your phone and your passcode, everything you have in your digital life or accessible via apps in your digital life, like your bank account, that's all then compromised. Uh, there is a setting I'm looking in the iPhone that says turn off passcode. But <laughs> your Apple Pay cards will be removed. Your Apple Watch will not automatically unlock. You will not be able to use this passcode to reset your Apple ID if you forget it. So yeah. I think your your solution is better, Mark uh, Marco. Just uh, don't let, just be careful, you know. Same way you yeah. would be when you go to your bank and you enter in your your ID for your ATM. Uh Exactly. Yeah. The, group, the, 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 the Joanna Stern article talks about how it's not just it's shoulder surfing and also just groups of two or three thieves who go to a bar, befriend victims, often asking them to open up Snapchat or some other social media platform. Uh, and then during that interaction, they would try to observe the victim. On, and some of them are being uh, uh, intimidated with violence into into uh, giving up the passcode. In addition to uh, in addition to stealing the phone itself, some are being drugged. It's um, it's it's tough. And, it's, and apparently this is. Uh, these cases being reported worldwide, so it's not something that is just someone being clever or stupid. It's it, hopefully it's something that Google and Apple can figure out how to address. But it's hard to it's hard to know how do you protect the user against someone has the phone, someone has the passcode. Ugh, that seems like a really tough thing to try to protect against. So I'm changing it to alphanumeric. That's an interesting uh, theory, Marco. That if it's long and alphanumeric, yeah. At least it'd be harder for somebody to shoulder surf. And and more importantly, it, it kind of teaches you this is a password. Right. You know, like it, so, so you would you would you might be a little bit more conscious of the ability for other people to see what you're typing if it looks and works more like a password. Right. Yeah. And I and I, I use long phrases for stuff that I have to type in. I, I have to admit I pulled back a little bit during COVID because I couldn't open my I get right. not being able to because <laughs> right. you know, I have a long I have a long passphrase and I do everything I can, especially in public, I have to do everything I can to use biometrics so I don't have to tie you know, tie it in. And usually my my phone is pretty uh, like it'll close up really fast. Although if someone got a hold of it, they'd be able to keep it keep it open. 
Um, I do think that there, like you could probably set some higher security setting where if it gets away from your, if it moves away from your watch, like you could have one of those things, like suddenly my phone's away from my watch and it just closes, you know, like it, it, it could just require you to log in if you're more than 15 feet from the watch kind of thing. Cause it, it has that data. So, mm-hmm. you know, you could do something like that where someone runs away and immediately, I mean, we, we say that, you know, obviously this is much more devastating because you can get into so many things. Um, now, um, we, you know, a lot of the things that have been done by Apple and Google have been really effective at keeping people from stealing other people's phones. You know, the fact that it's really hard to sell the phone now <laughs> has definitely cut down on, on phone there theft. A, there was a story about uh, even, you know, 2020 M1 Max being so hard because of activation lock to reuse yeah. that they're just scrapped. Yeah. Yeah, because it's, you know, and so that's, so it it's pretty, they're, I mean, our phones have never been more secure. But, but the problem is, is now that if you can, if you find a way through that, but I do think that a proximity against a, you know, it would obviously get you to buy a watch as well as a phone, but, but a proximity <laughs> uh, gear, I have to admit that when I'm in public, I'm, I'm pretty conscious of my phone. Like, like, you know, like it's, it's not a, well, it's now a, your ID, I, right? It's everything. I definitely take right? it pretty seriously. Yeah. Like I take my phone really seriously at, at, you know, and I don't, um, you know, I, I generally don't set it down. Like in, in general, you know. Well, I yeah, also, it's, it's, I, I noticed I have it turned on to unlock. If Face ID doesn't work to unlock with my watch, now I really have a problem because <laughs> somebody just has to be sitting next to me and they can unlock it. Right. And so uh, I'm going to turn that feature off too. It's easy to get lulled into this false, I mean, with the with your headphones, with your, with your phone, you think of it as an extension of like yourself and of your, it's like, like your eyeglasses. It's like you forget that you are sitting on a New York subway next to the door, holding a $1,100 computer in your, loosely in your hand and how easily someone who is on their way out, who's seen you not paying attention, just grab it and go before the, before the doors close. And I mean, I try to, I, I have to beat myself into remembering these, th- these sort of things. It's one of the reasons why I have more paperback books in my bag now, because if there are places where I don't want to be holding a thousand dollar phone in my hand, I can still, you know, read some PG Woodhouse or whatever, instead of having to be alone with my thoughts, which is of course anathema. <laughs> <laughs> and who wouldn't want to read PG Woodhouse <laughs> instead of being alone with their thoughts? Here's the story from vice in motherboard. Perfectly, perfectly good. MacBooks from 2020 are being sold for scrap because of activation lock. And it started because a a reseller, MacBook refurbisher, John Bumstead tweeted, how many of you out there would like a two-year-old M1 MacBook? Well, too bad, because your local recycler just took out all the activation locked logic boards and ground them into carcinogenic dust. (laughs) And it's the T2 security chip. And this is where, this is a tough balance for Apple because this activation lock does protect you from getting, you know, iPhone theft has gone way down because of it. Um, But at the same time, you know, it, it, it means the, f- the full functionality of these devices is not I available mean, unless you unlock I, it first. I think that you, you need to, I mean, that's just the process. If you're going to sell it or you're going to do something, you, you just got to do it. You yeah, gotta but do you've done this. Done. I bet like, I have forgot to do that, right? I don't, we I have guess, iPads I, I, around I, I, the studio that I can't to, get into because. Oh yeah. You know, I have, I have two of them that I think that yeah. they're going to be available in 64,000 years or something like that. Yeah. So it's, um, <laughs> I'm forward to that. Um, but, but the, um, he's the, talking about the fact that every time you enter a bad uh, code, <laughs> it's uh, it, it gets a lot. The wait gets longer and longer. <laughs> uh, there's one of them is sixty four thousand years, and and oh, so the that's, um, a, that's a dedicated of you. That's good. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The um, uh, but yeah, yeah, I think that you know the uh, it's like though you know, when you sell something that's expensive or you have something that's expensive, it takes time to you know un- unwrap that. I mean, some things are easy, but. You know, with your car, there's a registration, yeah, there's, a, that's there's, true. there's codes, there's things that have to be done to legally hand something over. So when people are reselling it, a reseller just has to like, if you're going to sell it to somebody, you're going to have to make sure that you go through the, you know, cr- yeah. you know, cross the T's and dot the I's. And if you're buying from eBay, you know, they're going to probably make sure that that's happening because they'll get a bad, they'll get a one star yeah. <laughs> if they don't. That's a, yeah. The, the, one of the biggest problems is that you have so many companies that will buy MacBooks by the hundreds, and they do like a two or three year upgrade cycle. And maybe they this is just a these these hundred laptops. They're just something they need to get off their current inventory. And so maybe they will take the time to reset all of them. Maybe they won't. And so that's how they re-enter the channel. Um, supposedly there is a. I've uh, isn't there a way that you if you can prove that you bought it, you can 
go through a lot of paperwork with Apple and they will like allow a remote reset. You can't, you won't be able to get back into the actual date, of course, but they will allow someone to set it up I as a new Mac. Can- I have two of the iPads that I'm looking at taking. I think you can take it to the Apple store and if you prove that you bought them. That you have to have that receipt, them. though. You have to have that um, receipt. Well, or if you bought them from the Apple store. Um, so oh, then they'll know. Okay. Yeah. All that data is there. Um, and and uh, and so I think that, and, and and I have to admit, the one thing I would highly recommend, I know people like to buy a lot of things. If you find a new Apple product, just go to the Apple store. I have bought them Absolutely. from all these different outlets. It is not, I stopped doing that like a decade ago. Yeah. It is not worth it. Buy them from the Apple store. Buy the buy the Apple Care and just it's all it, it's all there. It's all living just inside of your environment. Into this deep, warm, it is, developing so bath much of Apple. Because but you go, you go. And but here's the deal: is that you go to you you buy it from the AT and T store. It's a disaster. No, you buy it from Amazon. It's a disaster. Like it's they're all disasters. Other than just buying it from the Apple store, yeah. it, it it is, it, and it's just been so frustrating. Because I, I the same thing. I was like, oh, I'm somewhere where there's not an Apple store. I'm just going to buy it or whatever, nope. and I needed it. Nope. Let go just, and I let paid. Apple. I paid over and over again for (laughs) wandering off. It's, it's your mistake for wandering off the reservation. Yeah, exactly. Apple loves you and Apple has a marvelous plan for your life. Give yourself to Apple willingly. (laughs) Oh, my soul to the company store. Now, Apple has also been rewarding its shareholders. Uh, I just saw a story on seeking alpha that app. Remember Apple used to have like $150 billion in cash. (laughs) It's gone way down because They've been buying back stock and paying dividends. Uh, the company's spending about $110 billion a year in buybacks and dividends. They are now down to a mere $49 billion in net cash. Practically out of cash. Practically, practically out of money. Mm. It is significant because they're spending that cash on things like Apple TV plus shows and things like that. Uh, yeah. So They could probably buy Twitter. <laughs> you just they could just buy Twitter. Just that's like that that's like buying a rental car. It's like who, who wants it at this point? It's the previous owner did not take care of it, sir. Uh, or an old cop car, right? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah, it's I mean it's I mean it, it is it is annoying that like at least Apple hasn't been like engaging in mass layoffs it's really annoying when you see all these tech companies that have been do, spending billions of dollars uh, google spent something like 60 billion dollars last year in stock buybacks which does nothing but profit the people who are shareholders inside the company it makes their it makes investors happy but now they are also laying off 12,000 people and you have to ask yourself how many of those if they simply said that we are going to we're going to hold we're going to I'm going to do 30 billion dollars with a buybacks how many jobs how many projects could they have kept alive uh and yeah 50 billion dollars that's you know that's not as if not as if i got that much on me right now it's it's still an impressive amount of money but when you talk about uh that the that cash reserve is apple's screw you money so to speak to investors and to basically the rest of the market if they want to have a losing product for years and years and years while they figure out the market or perfect the technology if they want to make a really key opportunistic acquisition you want that you you want that hundred billion dollars instead of just fifty billion dollars because sooner or later you only have twenty billion dollars and now if you get into trouble if the unforeseen happens you don't have as much of a space cushion left over so I don't think I don't think it's a disaster but it's notable that uh, Apple is another company that has been uh, buying itself back hopefully not shooting itself in the foot and uh, limiting what it can do in the future in the, in the process. <laughs> and it's not, and it, and it really isn't buying itself back. I mean, you could buy yourself back, but that's not what I, I, Apple's just, I mean, yeah, pushing, pushing right. everybody's, pushing everybody's uh, value up. And we have to remember that one of the largest groups of stockholders uh, at any company like in, in Silicon Valley is, are the employees. Boys. And so the, the issue is, is that, you know, this is a, it's a pretty sensitive subject and, and it gives Apple a huge competitive advantage to have the cash, to be able to keep on moving the, even when things are, wherever they are, they can keep on moving that stock price up or stabilizing it in a way. I can tell you, I have friends at some of the companies that have had huge drops and it definitely affects morale. <laughs> like, you know, when you see your, when you see your stock options that were worth a million dollars worth 200,000, you think about it every day at work, yeah, you know, yeah. like, you know, and so, you know, cause it, to them, it just feels like they lost $800,000, you know? And, and so, so it's, it's not a, um, uh, you know, it, 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 it it's. I think that has more to do with employees and morale than it has to do with almost anything else for a, a company to stabilize the stock price. And Apple's been able to do that really effectively by buybacks. I didn't like it at first. I thought it was a huge, 
I thought it, like Apple should just, you know, you're lucky to be here. <laughs> you <Right. laughs> enjoy your stock. Well, Steve and, Jobs um, always said that. He said, I don't want to, I don't want to go yeah. public because then everybody will be watching their stock price instead of doing their work, doing their job. <laughs> hey, we but, this but just in piece. from our uh, Discord. Uh, this is the new Apple Fitness Plus program. You might enjoy this. I think, uh, I don't, I don't know. I think this is, uh, this is what I, I can't wait to do. <laughs> yeah, like I'm going to have a body like that. <laughs> Please. <laughs> hey, all right. Let's, let's wrap it up with uh, picks and so forth. But you know what? This might be a good time since Apple is spending a lot of money and Apple TV Plus is getting better and better. And I'm just wondering, uh, Marcos, there's anything you watch on Apple TV Plus or, or anywhere these days that you think people should be watching besides that fabulous fitness video? Yeah, besides that, I mean, that's that's really the, the mo thing I watch most. But, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's uh, I, no, you know, I'm body by Vintiot. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, like everyone else, I'm I'm waiting for Ted Lasso to start again. Yeah, um, but ultimately, I really want Severance. I, I, Me I'm too. like hurting for some Severance. They I don't know when it's coming hanging, back. Hanging, man, we were just. Oh hanging. my god! Uh, yeah, that's that, that's what I'm is waiting for. With it, like it's it it yeah it, yeah yeah. I I, I kind of I think that Apple's. Oops, sorry, I hit the wrong. What button. What'd you do? Oh, okay. I hit the wrong button. I was trying to remember. <laughs> um, the uh, <laughs> I bounced up. Uh, I um uh. I think Apple's starting to get its legs under it. You know, like I think that I feel I'm that way totally. In the first few years, Apple TV Plus was unremarkable was compared like, to Netflix or HBO. And now they've got some of the best stuff on TV. I, I love slow. Horses. Yeah. I, I think that I was, I was like, I, you know, I, I felt like the first round was a lot of Brussels sprouts, like, yeah. which I like, but, but, but yeah. only in certain, you know, like yeah. it's just, but, but I, I was just like, oh, this is not, it was, it, everything felt heavy and everything felt like it was important. And, and I just didn't, I just was like, oh, okay, I can't. And foundation, I really wanted, I mean, I was so excited about foundation. I made it through like three episodes and I was like, okay, I can't. Yeah. Anymore. I didn't finish it. And then uh, I watched so, Sharper the other night. Terrible, terrible. Was, and did you see shrinking the, uh, so I've heard good things about shrinking. I haven't seen it. Have you yeah. seen it? I haven't seen it no, yet, but it looks that. really good. Yeah. And then there was the other one about What's this the, hello, the, the tomorrow? hello tomorrow. That looks. I, I actually want to see that. It's yeah, the, so I'm really interested in a hello retro tomorrow. future. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so anyway, so Ted Lasso coming back in March, but here's the question: It looks like Apple is hiring somebody to put ads in it. I wonder, I thought about that a lot. I saw that article come out and I think it has more to do with sports. So I don't know if, I don't know if they're going to put ads into the VO, you know, their, their um, creative, the narrative uh, work. But I think that where it does make sense is MLS. So to, to think about how you're going to put ads, you know, into your, because man, I'll tell you, that's what's really valuable in sports is ads because people are there and they stay there and it's live and they, yeah. you know, they, there's they a thing. So anything. I think that, yeah. If I was, I think that that makes, because I was like, really, are they going to, like, are they going to ruin this? You know, like, like, I just ruin it with the ads. And um, this now is they a, may a make story a tear. From, from The Verge, Jay Peters writing in The Verge. Yeah. Apple has hired an advertising executive to help build a TV plus ads. Actually, no, sorry. It comes from the information. Let's give the information uh, credit because they get, that's a good scoop from Sahil Patel. Apple's and hired also Lauren be Fry, a TV and digital video advertising exec executive. And, and it could be an ad, it could be an advertised, um, like an ad tier, like you're not going to pay for Apple TV plus, I mean, but you're going to right. watch ads. They you have know, ads so in be, the baseball games, don't they? I think they do. Yeah, yeah I think so. I don't know yeah, why I got the impression it was Ted Lasso. It. Maybe somebody else made that uh, assumption because it doesn't say Ted Lasso mm -hmm. in the, uh, in the information story. All right. Yeah. So it could be, it could be an ad layer. It could be, and, and Apple obviously... Apple TV Plus, uh, they're trying to get out to everywhere, so they put it on all these TVs. And the problem is, is that you know the performance of Apple TV Plus is so much lower on the TVs than it is on the Apple TV <laughs> that that it's it's kind of a bummer, you know that they that they did that. Um, um, but uh, but you so know you got to watch Netflix, Disney, Disney Plus, awesome. HBO, see if they start putting ads in their episodic content. If they do, I'll be pissed. That then Apple yeah. could do it, but I don't think Apple's going to be the first to do it. By I mean, any they already Ooh. start with like six minutes of ads before every episode of everything yeah. that you have to skip through. Ugh, it's awful. Yeah. Awful. Yeah. And could this have something to do with embedded ads? Like when they basically digitally put in, oh, here's a brand of cereal that they're, they're, it could they're be. drinking. That they're Product placement. Week. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. It could be. I was watching um, 
There's a new show uh, with uh, Ava Green on Apple TV called Liaison, and I knew oh, how is that? We're looking. At that. I knew immediately mm -hmm. Lisa I loves it. it. Good. You should, yeah. Okay. I love Eva Green. We've only seen the first episode, but you know, immediately it's not an Apple production because she's got an Android phone and <laughs> there's a Windows laptop. And it's like, oh, they bought this one. <laughs> or she's bad. Or, or she's a, bad. She's a bad person. She's a bad person. Yeah. Uh, it's a Fran uh, uh, It's clearly Android... a Franco uh, British, uh, you know, right. joint production because it's half okay. in French. And it's good. You yeah. know, it has a lot of potential. I found a lot of plot holes in the first. Ep uh, episode like come on man that's not what yeah. <laughs> but if you can ignore plot holes they've got a, it's got a great cast yeah yeah i'll have to keep i'll have to keep watching and letting you know let's do our picks of the week because it's time to wrap this episode up mark arm so thrilled to have you on i uh i'm you know i'm a big fan many of our users uh use overcast to listen to our shows our listeners we appreciate it uh you do a great job and we often recommend Thank you so it. much. Yep. Yep. Do you have anything you would like to pick of any kind? Book, movie, software? Not really. I've I've been uh I, I think what I would just say is, you know, look, you're all listening to a podcast. Uh go out and find find something new that you haven't heard before. Uh th there is still so much being produced in this open world of podcasting that we are all, you know, in and trying to preserve and expand and and keep healthy. Uh, there is so much here and everyone, you know, if, if there's some show that goes behind Spotify or whatever and you don't want to follow it, you don't have to. There is so much here. So go out and try try a podcast you never heard an episode of before. Just go try a new one. It, it, it you know, it, it can be easy to get stuck in the rut of what you already know, what you already subscribe to and just never add new ones. Go add a new one. I like that. Absolutely. Support that 100 percent and make it not be a true crime or celebrity driven podcast. <laughs> Just my suggestion. <laughs> if you like true crime, okay, go ahead. Marco, a real pleasure. Overcast.fm. Uh, Marco's uh, personal site is marco.org. Is that right? I think it is. That's right. I, I even updated it maybe every two years. <laughs> but you can see all the things he does, all the other podcasts, like the Accidental uh, Tech podcast uh, that he that he's involved in. It's really great. Uh, yeah, so it's been a, it's been it's been a year since you. Did the overcast redesign? So, God, you that must be like you don't want to do that, right? A redesign. What the redesign? Yeah, <laughs> that must just be what a pain in the butt. That was so much, and the problem is that whole redesign. I did it all in Objective C and UI <sighs> Kit, and 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 that, part of the reason I want to move the whole app over to Swift UI is that I know I could have done it way faster, yeah. and I can change it way faster. Yeah. So I, it's going to be a long time to before this is done, but. I, I will get to a better place eventually. <laughs> but if you're a fan of San Francisco Rounded, you're going to be a fan of Overcast. It's free in the App Store. Go get it. Thank you, Marco. Really appreciate you taking the time to be with us. Thank you. Now get back to work. Uh, Andy and Akko, <laughs> when, uh, let's get a pick of the week out of you, sir. Uh, this is a really fun, like, virtual game platform that I came across a few weeks ago. Uh, it's called Pico 8. And it is, you, you might have heard of, I'm sure you've heard of emulators that will emulate an old Game Boy, will emulate an old Nintendo. So this developer decided to, what if we were to emulate a game platform that never existed? Uh, so what if we design <laughs> a virtual game platform that is specifically so that you can design these little, like, retro style games, but they don't have to be retro, uh, under limitations that will create an aesthetic that will basically be across uh, every single development. So it's uh, every, the display, quote unquote, is 128 pixels square 16 colors oh wow uh the four four channel sound of uh 256 sprites they def they definitely look like they're of a time but you don't have to be like an old retro person i don't i don't like uh, I, I love my uh, uh I, I love my uh my play date because my my style of gaming is that i don't want to spend the hours and weeks and months uh figuring out how to play a game i just want to relax for an hour on a little puzzle or a little piece of interactive art and so this is what the limitations of pico 8 create uh, and uh, every and the development system is interesting. So they have, they have virtual carts cartridges that are actual PNG files. They're just P PNG files with all the three two K of the, code. These are animated PNGs. No, they're not. They're not. It's a it's a scripting language. You script in Lua, 
Uh, but everything you everything that all the assets for the game, all the code for the game is in this PNG file. You can also do it with a with a text file. Uh, but the entire dev system is actually within this platform. So uh, the uh, the background editor, sprite editor, music editor, they're all inside here. You can also use your own external text editor to do that. But the idea is that to again give people creative limitations that they can work not that they have to break through but that they can work inside to create again these charming little games that are actually su surprisingly sophisticated uh, and so you you run these by buying a 50 you they can either be run inside a web browser so you can go to uh, the pico 8 site and just play these games or you can if you want to d develop or take a look at the code that people have written for these other games 15 bucks will will uh, give you an app on uh, on the on the mac that gives you everything it's also available for Windows, also available for Linux. You can also run it on Raspberry Pi. There are a couple of handheld platform, actual physical handheld platforms that will also run these things. But primarily it's designed to be, again, an emulator for a game system that never existed. It is so charming and so much fun for the kind of gaming that I like, which is, again, I want to I want to play a maze game or, 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 or a, an RPG or a simple like arcade game. And just like while I've got 15 minutes while I'm waiting for something to have to, to to waiting for a zoom call or something i just want to relax and, and decompress it doesn't involve again 60 bucks investment and then like three months in which you are so emotionally tied up in this game that you don't only until you see feel sunlight on your face and you realize that oh I just blew. I just wasted an entire night's sleep because I was trying to figure out why this woman was walking through this swamp and saying such ghostly things. Uh, so you can play it for free. Again, I I bought the fifteen dollar app because I wanted to support this. Uh, it's in beta, but it's very very sophisticated right now. There are thousands and thousands of these games that people have uploaded. Not not a good platform for making money off of because it really is designed to be uh, show off what you made, share what you made, and let other people see it's your code. Quite cool, uh, boy. It really, it Where's really the crank, is. though. It needs a crank. It needs a crank. You know, I mean, well, you know, it's once once you go crank, you don't go bang. <laughs> you don't go or bang. Whatever. <laughs> so, do you find yourself playing this more, or your uh, little play thing, play on there? Uh, I still, I still, I still love my play date. It has the same sort of charm, the same sort of advantages that I think that uh, Pico Eight had, and one of the things that made me want to buy this that I, f I had a feeling that this would attract attract like creative and slightly weird developers that would be attracted to this really odd form factor that really has so much that's familiar so much that's unfamiliar so there's so many really really creative games on this so i'm still buying games for this i'm still playing it a lot but it's nice but uh it is 200 like it is 200 bucks and also uh, there, I don't think if you order now, you st there's still like a two or three month wait. With with Pico Eight, you can just go to a website and start playing these cool games uh, without any investment whatsoever. Definitely they, w worth looking at. They have a sister uh, simulation called Voxatron, which is all uh, voxel based. So. That was yeah. That the developer of, of Voxatron basically developed Pico Eight off of that project mm. where he's he was voxatron was, is still a very real thing but he had this idea of gee what if we simplified this and gee what if there were like a game development system that had limitations and like i said i'm really really pleased with this i was i was uh I, i'm not so not so much that i'm maybe going to be buying like a handheld so i can do this while i'm uh, play these games while i'm uh, waiting for a subway or something uh but i'm this is the sort of creativity that you really really want to reward it is a it is a creative app that allows other people to be creative and basically f f f fly, fly their own freak flags inside the game space. So I'm, I'm really thrilled with it. They also have an education edition and the, they offer site-wide licenses for schools and public libraries and other educational spaces, which is really cool. Honestly, the game, it's not the graphics, it's the game. And you could make, I'm sure, a brilliant game. Exactly. It's, it's an, it's, it's an aesthetic. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't like, I don't like, uh, uh, I, I don't like uh, retroness. I don't like nostalgia because it, it all smacks of oh, remember, remember how awesome it was to be a teenager and to yeah. be in the eighties and about that's nothing. This is this is a very much a 2022 2023 thing but with the idea of let's have a game platform with no microtransactions with uh, it's very easy a very cheap buy-in it's very easy to play these games it's very easy to develop or learn how these games were made uh again i just four stars all across the board for me on this good recommendation thank you andy mr alex Lindsay. what I you guys want to say for the record i didn't know that what andy was going to re refer to when i 
put mine in. <laughs> so, so anyway. Oh, this is so, similar. Um, ah, you guys are well, gamers. Well, it's not the same. It's, it's, it actually, they think they will go together, which is, <laughs> so my recommendation is scenario GG, scenario dot GG. This is a, a AI, it's a generative uh, art that's designed for game assets. So you could probably use it to generate assets that you could put into what, what <laughs> Andy's talking about. So basically this is kind of the beginning of kind of the, if you look at what they're doing here and I'm just getting started with it. So, but this is kind of the grown up, like this is where AI goes as it starts to um, pick up speed, which is that you can give it, you can train it, you can give it guidance. There are many generators. Um, there are things that you can work on there and there, and, oh, and it's really, really interesting. You can start, you can huh. upload a bunch of images and say, I want you to look at this and I want you to build these assets. It's going to build a whole bunch of assets. It's not like, I mean, I love mid journey, as you know, <laughs> but, but I, um, but the, the thing is, is that I, um, with mid journey, you can't really guide it very much. You kind of like throw in the, the, the prompts and hope, you because know, because you, you don't you can, control the data set, but right. in this case, you so this one lets you start to put, How have control over that and start to guide it and start to get, and get the assets that you need for an actual game. Um, they just, they literally just raised a bunch of money. So this is going to go, this is going to go, um, probably go big. Um, but it, it it's, uh, but we, Boy, graphic I've been artists must be the founders for months trembling yeah, in their boots. This is bad news for designers, for who? graphic artists, right? Uh, maybe. I mean, I think that a lot of times people will take, take this stuff and, and get, you know, what we found the people who are the most, the benefit the most is people who understand what, with all this generative art, understand what they're trying to get, understand, figure, quickly figure out how this makes their job faster and easier and starts to take advantage of it rather than the folks that are resisting will probably, you know, not, not do as well. Oh, it's too um, bad NFTs are, collapse because this would be a great way to make the next generation of bored apes. <laughs> yeah. No, well, I mean, we thought, we, we thought about it. We started playing with it. That's how I got into mid journey is I was like, I'm going to build a bunch of NFTs, um, <laughs> you know, like, you know, just put like fun things that they were going to, you know, that I wanted to, I was waiting for, the gas fees to go down so that I can make them like nothing. Like I didn't right. want to spend, you know, the hundred dollars per, you know, unit is not, not practical. So anyway, the, um, uh, anyway, so I think that this is going to be, but this is the, one of the few ones that you see that I would call grow, you know, mid journey is kind of like teenage, uh, AI, but this is really grown up AI. This is like, I got to do something with it. I'm trying to generate things. I need more control than just putting in a prompt. And, um, and it just gives you a sense of where things are going. Um, so I think that even if you're not necessarily interested in it, it's worth going to the website, build an account, play with it a little bit, but understand like this is, this is a much bigger step towards how AI generative art is going to, is going to move. Well, absolutely clear that the, what you're seeing now in AI is not the end game. It's just the it's not beginning. Even close. And I mean, this people is, are going to do much more interesting things than just have a chat bot. Well, it, it, it's democratizing creativity. And and what I mean by that is that a lot of us, you know, have to, you know, a director for a film doesn't run the cameras, doesn't run the lights, doesn't move the, move the C stands around. They have an, a vision. They have a vision and they have millions of dollars to hire people to do those, those visions. And what we're moving to are very quickly is people having a vision and being able to have and, and be able to create some of those visions without without a, a, a without having, you know and again if you're very very talented it, this is not i don't think this is really going to affect you anytime soon probably in most people's lifetimes or careers at least but if you are mediocre to getting started this is going to be really difficult you know for folks to to kind of figure that out and so um but but again it's it is a uh it's a, it's going to be an explosion of creativity i think and i think that you know because we we had, I mean, this stuff has been around for a long time. I worked, I went to a research facility in the late nineties where they give me a sphere and you just went like this and a sphere appeared and we were in VR and you could pull the thing around and everything else. And that room cost $20 million. <laughs> so, so, but, but the, um, but this kind of stuff, that's what we're going to get to is someone can walk in and there's rumors that Apple's working on this. You can walk in and say, I want this, I want this, give me a tree, give me a this, you know, and it starts putting the things in, you start moving them around. Um, and that's going to really change the way people the average person who has ideas but doesn't have the skills can actually, um, you know, execute the, on those ideas. Mm. Um, and I think that that's going to be you know, a really interesting, you know, it, yeah. it, it, and when people say, well, anybody can, if everybody can do it, then it'll be nothing. But well, everybody can have a pencil and paper. It doesn't mean, mean <laughs> what happened to podcasts. Everybody could do it. 
Yeah, but doesn't it, it, you know? But most of them are again. It it falls away pretty. There's not that many pod. I mean, there's yeah, no, no, that's thousands right. of them are good, but it there's gives, not the quality is a, a huge number of people who have the ability and the skills, but don't have the whatever the technical expertise or a mm -hmm. twenty million dollar room to do stuff. I think you're right. I think it's a it's yeah. a lever. Yeah, it's gonna be uh, interesting. Fascinating. Anyway, this scenario is, this is a really dot gg. What's yeah, it cost? This is just a much more. Uh, I'm. I, I have a free version. <laughs> I, I, they didn't give it to me. I'm just saying I downloaded it. I got in. No they don't one's asking mention for money price yet. anywhere. Yeah. I, I, no one's asking for money yet. I'm just experimenting with it and playing with it and building little assets that I'll, I don't know what I'd use for, but I, yeah. I'm playing with it, uploading images and putting things in. So I don't, I have this no one's This is a good time to yet. start playing with AI because everybody is trying to figure out what to do to monetize and using your inputs to help tune their products. So why not, you know, take advantage of this right now? Uh, well, and, and again, to start charging for it. Yeah. yeah, it's much easier to understand it when it's moving slowly. You know, like it's when it's when it's not when things are still early and they're not and they're still in their very early state. It's much easier to understand it. It's much easier to play with it. It's much easier so that you can start to see what those trajectories are going to look like. And so when I, I jump on, a, I mean, my business is mostly jumping on something that no one's ever done before and figuring out how to turn it into something. But so I'm constantly, anything new, I'm always like, okay, let's mm -hmm. take a look at this and figure mm -hmm. out how to assimilate it. And then I make decisions like I jumped on, on Clubhouse for like two weeks and I was like, this is going to be a disaster. And I left, <laughs> you know, and so, so anyway, so, so the, um, but so I, so I jump on a lot of these things and, but I think this one's really interesting. I think that they're, you know, the founders are really, I mean, I, again, I've been tracking them on Twitter, you know, like, um, uh, and watching what they're posting and, and really, um, paying attention to like where they're going. And I, it's, it's a really interesting approach to it. So it's going to be interesting. Scenario.gg. Thank you, everybody. Marco Arment, marco.org, overcast.fm, the Accidental Tech Podcast. He's Marco Arment on mastodon.social. Really appreciate your uh, taking the time here. Thank you so much. It's been fun. It's been real fun. Andy and I we'll do again another 700 episodes. 700 episodes for now. <laughs> Expect a call on my transceiver, super duper heterodyne space radio. Andy Anako, when are you going to be on GBH next? I'm off this week, but I'm on next Thursday at 1230. Go to WGBHnews.org to stream it, listen to it live or later. Nice. Thank you, Andy. And uh, Alex Lindsay, of course, officehours.global is a great way to, you can see, and Alex is a font of creativity to tap into that. The Mid Journey was the show today. If you, you you did a little segment for us on Mid Journey, but this is the full blown. It's an hour of us talking. It's not yeah. just me. It's like an hour of us talking about Mid Journey. So so we're all like right. you know talking about what's working, what's not working, right. and and um, you know some guides. It's it's a little bit more expands expands from that. And we had a uh, a great session yesterday about the market. You know your brand and how to build your brand and 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 so on and so forth. And and so it's been. It's really good. Psychoacoustics tomorrow. Yes. Yeah, Office video tomorrow. shoots on Thursday. <laughs> the <laughs> variety of stuff that you cover. What is a pedagogy wheel? You mean pedagogy? What's a pedagogy? Uh, it might be a misspelling. We'll take a look at it, but it should be pedagogy. Uh, <laughs> okay. you know, it's, it's really understandable. I know you have a lot of educators ideas about on, on education. Yeah. 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 So we have a lot of, nice. a lot of discussions about that. Yeah. Fantastic stuff. Officehours.global. Free to all. You can watch on YouTube, but you can also join in. It's a Zoom call every morning. Thank you it's all. on YouTube, yeah. On YouTube, yeah. The, yeah. the easiest way to watch it is just, just watch YouTube. the YouTube, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you all. But if you want to ask questions, join the Zoom. It's all in. It's all there at Office well, here's, the, here's the worst part is I figured out how to make it another hour long. Um, you know, so <laughs> so we we were like, we look at all these questions and I'm like, why don't we sit around and talk about the questions before the show starts? And now people are, everyone's showing up early and, and there's a whole thing. I was like, this is now going to be a four hour show. Uh, <laughs> yeah, like today's was two hours and 12 minutes. Well, they're all two hours, but the thing is, is there's usually, there's an hour that happens before the two hours of us like doing mic checks and oh. talking and everything else. But now we started turning into work because now we look at all the oh. we look at all the questions and we're like, so you're gonna have to do an hour before the, the hour, getting ready for the <laughs> hour that's getting ready. That's that's exactly how this is all gonna turn out. Oh. I, as soon as I did it, I was like, oh, this is too much fun. We had so much fun talking about the questions. I was like, I just have to get up earlier this now. Is I, mean, I, don't need, I don't need to sleep. This is Alex's yeah, exactly. problem. He can't stop. Can't stop. Thank you all for joining us. We do Mac Break Weekly, uh, Tuesdays, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern Time. That's uh, 1900 UTC if you want to watch us live at live.twit.tv. If you're watching live, chat live at our IRC, open to all, irc.twit.tv. If you're a Club Twit member, you can chat in our Discord. Always a lot of fun there. 
Club Twit, seven bucks a month, ad-free versions of all of our shows. You also get the Discord, which has turned out to be, as far as I'm concerned, the best darn community out there. Really great hang. Uh, and not just for the shows. I mean, it's every topic geeks are interested in. And then, of course, the Twit Plus feed with additional shows like Micah Sargent's Hands on Macintosh and Paul Thorat's Hands on Windows, the Untitled Linux Show, the Giz Fizz, and all of that. Uh, Twit.tv slash Club Twit. Seven bucks a month. I think it's a great deal, and we sure appreciate it. Helps us keep the lights on. And increasingly, <laughs> that's getting harder and harder to do. Uh, if you want to watch the show after the fact, there's audio and video at twit.tv slash mbw. There's a YouTube channel dedicated to Mac Break Weekly. And of course, it's easiest to subscribe in Overcast. That way you'll get it automatically. Just, just download Overcast and, and subscribe to Mac Break Weekly. And, and you'll get it every week the minute it's available. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Now it's my sad duty to say, get back to work. Because break time is over. Bye-bye. Hey, I'm Rod Pyle, Editor-in-Chief of Ad Astra Magazine, and each week I join with my co-host to bring you This Week in Space, the latest and greatest news from the final frontier. We talk to NASA chiefs, space scientists, engineers, educators, and artists, and sometimes we just shoot the breeze over what's hot and what's not in space, books, and TV. And we do it all for you, our fellow true believers. So whether you're an armchair adventurer or waiting for your turn to grab a slot in Elon's Mars rocket, join us on This Week in Space and be part of the greatest adventure of all time.